we start? Uh, fine with staff. All right, are the directors ready to start? Yes. Yes. All right. <clears throat> It's four o'clock, that's start the meeting. I would like to welcome members of the public to, who joined us for part two of our financial workshop. And I believe before the roll call, general manager has some housekeeping messages. Sure, I'm happy to cover this. Firstly, can everybody hear me? Raise your hand if you can, or a thumbs up. Great, I'm seeing a bunch of hands, wonderful. Um, welcome members of the public, if any are tuning in. My name is Robert Shaver and I serve as the general manager for the district. Again, conducting virtual board meetings is still a relatively new experience for us. So if we experience any technical glitches tonight, please uh, be patient as we work through those. Thank you. Uh, members of the public may participate in this meeting either via the Zoom application or by telephone. If you're participating, by Zoom, generally we ask that all panelists and participants mute their microphones unless speaking. That includes staff and members of the board as well. You may also be placed on mute by the district secretary. The district secretary will unmute participants at the appropriate time when the board is receiving public comments. In Zoom, you will be able to view the presentation materials as they are presented to the board and at any time, you may submit a question or raise your hand if you're muted and have questions or if you would like to address the board. And there's little icons in Zoom to do that. If you're participating using telephone audio, again, please refrain from making comments until prompted by the district secretary or the board president. And unless you're speaking, please put your phone on mute. That will assure the best sound quality for everyone. If you're using Zoom and a phone at the same time, uh, you should turn off the audio on one of those devices or we will probably experience weird echo and feedback issues. The presentation slides are located on the district's website, www.acwd.org. If you have access to the website, you may download the slides and follow along that way. If you're on the phone, you may press star six to get the attention of the district secretary. The Zoom webinar will be recorded and will be made accessible to the public for future viewing. Again, uh, oh, and the board does have a number of closed session items this evening uh, that will be covered at the end of the meeting or near the end. While the board convenes privately in closed session, members of the public may remain logged into Zoom if you are interested in any board reports once the closed sessions are concluded. Again, thank you for attending this evening. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. With that, Ms. Marku, roll call, please. <clears throat> Directors Akbari? Present. Gunther? Present. Steffi? Yeah. <laughs> Reed? And Wong? Here. Here. I heard something over the barking. So with that, Director Weed, would you lead us in the salute to the flag, right. please? Thank you. Ms. Jeremy, I pledge allegiance okay. to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God, indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For all. Thank you. And the next item is public comment on matters on this notice of special board meeting. Do I have any members of the public that wish to address the board at this time? Hearing none and seeing no hand raised, um, let's move on to the next item, review of fiscal year 2019-20 and 2020-21 preliminary budget, please. Okay, thank you, Madam President. Um, as I mentioned last week, the budget preparation process spans several months and involves literally dozens of employees. I believe that this budget is prudent, responsible, and moves the district further towards meeting the board's strategic goal that the directors identified a few years ago, as well as most recent feedback that staff has received during board workshops and other venues. I just want to say that, again, how personally proud I am of all the five departments and under manager of finance, Jonathan Wunderlich's guidance, 
uh, they have all contributed to and collaborated on what we were presenting this evening to the board. And I will turn this over to John now, and we will continue the discussion from where we left off on May 21st. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Shaver. Uh, so last Thursday, we began the budget presentation at last week's workshop. Last week, we covered the overarching budget assumptions and key planned activities for the upcoming fiscal year. And we also reviewed the proposed operating budget. Uh, we plan on commencing this evening's presentation with the updated capital improvement program. And that presentation will be led by Reka Ipagunta, our project engineering manager. Following Reka's presentation, Sydney Alm, our supervising financial analyst, will review a number of different financial planning scenarios. And at the conclusion of that discussion, we will be ready for final budget review and discussion uh, or any final comments from the board. So before we jump into that and Reka commences her presentation, I did want to ask if there were any follow-up questions or any interest from the board to review uh, any of the material again that was discussed last week. Um, I, we le well, I'm not certain where we left, uh, this is John Weed, where we left it with the ongoing uh, positions. We were going to be doing some studies in two areas. One was, uh, as I understand it, related to looking at the amount of doing actual tests or the amount of uh, water uh, revenue we got from different meters when we lined them up in, in tandem. And the other was to do uh, another type of a survey. What what was the final result from last week? Or the, what was the direction as uh, per staff of what happened after the last meeting? Yeah, so I, I believe both of those issues relate perhaps to AMI items that were discussed before we commenced the budget workshop. And so, um, you know, I will defer to Mr. Stevenson or Mr. Shaver uh, to review uh, kind of staff's current understanding of those items. Yeah, I'm happy to um, step in, thank you. And because AMI is part of the budget, a significant part of the budget and part of the overall presentation that the board uh, received last week and we're continuing this week, um, you know, it's perfectly appropriate to, to follow up on that. And so uh, last week, the board expressed interest in staff developing some sort of pilot project to evaluate um, ultrasonic meters. And staff committed to come back to the board um, with a plan to do so. And the AMI customer portal software uh, that the board tabled last week uh, were scheduled to come back to the board on June 11th, I believe, uh, to continue that item. So that's where we are on that. And then the second issue, Director Weed, was? Well, that was really the two, the two questions in the two reports. Um, it was my hope that staff would go back and revisit just the literature to show that there is this, a difference between the um, revenue uh, received by identically sized meters of different types over the extended period of time and that uh, based on that literature we can confirm it with a study but that was not part of the analysis i was hoping that it would be i have subsequently submitted as of today a uh, issue related to rate structure which I thought was also not included in the original analysis that shows that it, based on our current rate structure and a 5% conservation, our pro forma should show an additional $50 million in cost to the district, making the AMI cost over 100 million. And then based on the size of the meters, yet another 50 million. So we could well be talking about a delta of $150 million. That's pretty significant, or the total cost of $150 million for the project as proposed. So, so that's quite this way. Um, I believe we voted to proceed with AMI in terms of the widgets. The item we table was a, just a customer portal. Right, so, and then there was the request for a pilot. And I can say though, as part of getting back uh, to the board on the uh, potential scope and breadth of a pilot, 
uh, staff will um, also uh, evaluate available literature uh, relative to the different types of meters and incorporate that into whatever proposal we make. Right. Yeah, let me suggest part of that literature, as I noted in my memo, is to contact Lynn Reynolds and the North Coast Water District um, and their experience when they did the same measurements with similar types of equipment. I appreciate uh, you sharing your thoughts and ideas, Director Weed. Staff will consider that as we move forward. Thank you. And I was going to say, if the question is regarding financial assumptions, I am sure we'll be proceeding down that path in part two of the workshop today, correct? Yeah, we'll be reviewing a range of financial planning scenarios in uh, part two of what's planned for uh, this evening's workshop. Yep. You know, we are not revisiting detailed assumptions underlining the AMI business yep. case. We're talking about big picture overall district financial planning assumptions. And nor are we planning <clears throat> on getting into details regarding uh, rate structure, alternatives, yep. and, um, and specific rate proposals. Uh, that is planned for uh, the, sort of the potentially the December timeframe, depending on what guidance we receive from the board this evening okay. on budget. So I would suggest that we proceed with um, our presentation. I'll ask, I'll ask one more question because it begs it based on the conversation. If we do determine 50 to $100 million mistake or er, uh, error in the analysis or omission in the analysis, will there be an opportunity for the board to revisit that before the conduct? Will we have, have an opportunity to, to vote on, on the contracts before they're issued? Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Okay, will, this, uh, will the AMI be coming back to the board for a final uh, go ahead? No. It, the contract, we have approved a contract we have not uh, reviewed. You have approved the contract for the implementation of a Badger AMI system. What That's you have not approved is, a, is the implementation of the customer portal uh, that provides the face of the AMI to our customers. And that includes the acquisition of almost 80,000 obsolete, technically obsolete meters. Okay, thank you. President Wong. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I had uh, planned on asking a couple of questions and put in a couple of requests on AMI at the uh, end of our meeting under director comments, but if you're comfortable, it's very quick. I could bring it up right now. I guess we could consider this part of the director's comment. <laughs> All right. So... <clears throat> Uh, I'm not trying to backtrack on our uh, agreement to move forward. I'm just trying to ask for some clarification here. Pardon my voice today. Um, it was never mentioned in the meeting what the cost difference is between um, the standard Badger meter and the ultrasonic meter. Does anybody, can anybody report on that difference in price right now? Yeah, I think we did provide some yeah. data on that at the last meeting, but I will defer to uh, Mr. Stevenson, who I believe will recall those numbers better than I do. Yeah, this, this is Ed. I just wanted to um, point out that the presentation did include the, the percent difference mm -hmm. between ultrasonic and PD. Uh, between 48% and 63%, I think the numbers were. Um, uh, that uh, staff negotiated a better price than that for the ultrasonic that we were proposing. However, when we talk about, um, when we bring back, the, certainly the results of the pilot work, we'll bring that back in the context of um, what it would mean in the way of overall cost and <coughs> project impacts to switch to 100% ultrasonic, because clearly that's what we're evaluating. So we'll so, bring that back. So um, I'm testing my understanding here that it would have been uh, substantially more expensive as a project to go all ultrasonic. Mm -hmm. Yes. We're talking tens of millions of dollars more. 
It may not be tens of millions. Um, one of the things just to remind the board is that um, we have not negotiated a 100% ultrasonic option. Um, that was one of the proposals from Badger, but that was not the negotiated proposal. So staff puts a lot of effort into negotiating the overall um, deal. Mm -hmm. And that of course includes the costs of the, the components to be, to be installed. So that obviously is meters. So, um, so we will be bringing back um, what the actual cost to, to the district would be if we were to switch to um, full ultrasonic. And we'll also bring back um, uh, uh, other factors that would play into that decision. Okay, so so that let's put a stop here. Well, We're making me uncomfortable Mr. here since AMI well, is not on the agenda. If I might have a clarification, one case I was told this would not be coming back to us. Now we're told that there is an option for this to come back to us to look at a 100% ultrasonic. So, so, so uh, what, what I said was that the AMI project has been awarded to Badger. Um, so far, I don't believe we have board direction to negotiate a 100% ultrasonic option with Badger. Do we have the option to do that? <clears throat> And I presented uh, some in the, my memo, uh, uh, an estimate of a $50 million net present value difference in the water revenues that we would receive from ultrasonic versus po a positive displacement for the uh, smaller meters. Staff right. serves at the pleasure of the board. If the board asks us to do that, we would be happy to do so. Um, President Wong, I'm either gonna bring up my questions or requests right now, or under director's comments later in the meeting. I would prefer just to complete it real quickly here. So I got my, my question answered. Okay. I'm satisfied with that. I have a, <clears throat> a couple of requests for a future meeting, maybe the next time we review uh, AMI. I would, uh, none of the other bids were presented, what the cost was on them and uh, what the trade-offs were that staff evaluated between each of the proposals that came in. I'm very satisfied with the approach we're taking right now, but I would really like to understand what the other cost and technology trade-offs were in the other proposals. So uh, just so that um, staff is clear on what the request is, is this for the customer portal portion that the board did not approve? Uh, last week, or is this for some, because there are several components to the AMI? No, I'm, I'm talking about what the board approved last week. Um, sure. Should we bring this back to committee? Since the board already acted on it, or is this something that the whole board would like to see? I would suggest you bring it back to committee, since the board has acted on the item already. Um, there is option for further negotiation based on the study on the meters, but at this point we have voted in the water dot contract. So I suggest if you have questions, Director Sappy, regarding the multiple bids that's received, discuss okay, so, in the committee. Uh, Director Sethi is on two different committees, the Water Resources and Conservation and the LICA committee. Um, his uh, uh, his partner on both committees is the same person. So I, uh, if, if it's okay, then staff will just pick the appropriate, uh, the appropriate committee and bring it back to one of those two. Um, I'd be satisfied with that um, coming to okay. my committee. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's go with that. And the uh, last part of my request is, <clears throat> I really don't buy the uh, payback period that was in the presentation last week, but I didn't want to hold up moving forward here. And we were showing a payback period of 8.7 years and that comes out to exactly where we were on the previous financial analysis on payback and ROI. What I would like to see from staff is uh, a reanalysis of the payback period and a reanalysis of the ROI. And I want to see the old analysis side by side with the new analysis on payback and ROI. 
And for the new uh, analysis, I would go with $50 million. That's what I want to see. The cost of the AMI program implementation plus what we're spending uh, with EMA. And uh, leave out the portal software because we would have moved forward with something like that anyway. So uh, I, my recollection was that the old payback period and, and uh, return on investment was based on something closer to 35, 36 million dollars. Now we're 10 million more than that. And we weren't even including all of the AMI, EMA expenses. So I would really like to see that perhaps at the next meeting where we are reviewing the, the uh, portal um, information. Um, the request is to review the pay, to confirm uh, the, the payback period uh, information uh, when we come back to the board in June. Is that the request? Payback period and return on investment. Uh, I think we can do that. Can we do that, Mr. Stevenson? Sure. Okay, thank you. I could uh, add on to this. There was a, the shorter payback period was based on a 5% conservation rate. I would ask if you can find any evidence anywhere that there's significant conservation for AMI, particularly in the 5% rate. I use that as a number in my memo, and although in truth, I believe it's all smoke. Thank you, directors, and thank you, Director Sethi, for limiting your comments, your your director's comments to just comments and skip the discussions. That was what was actually making me uncomfortable. It's not actually the fact that you're making the comments. It's a discussion that kind of was <laughs> me going, uh. Thank you um, very much. I'm going to mute myself out. Any other directors want to make a comment during director's comments as we move this item forward? Hearing none, I am going to say, Mr. Wonderlick, that's proceed on part two of our budget. Preview. All right. Uh, not having heard any questions about the budget presentations given last week on the budget assumptions and operating budget, I will then go ahead and turn it over to Reka Ipagunta, our project engineering manager, to present the CIP update. Well, um, could someone let me share the screen, please? Well, can you, can everyone see my screen here? <laughs> Great. Okay, good evening, members of the board and members of the public. My name is Reka Ipagunta and I'm the project engineering manager and I oversee the capital uh, implementation of our capital improvement program at the district. Before I start the cap capital improvement program update, I just want to go back one slide um, to connect with where we have stopped last time. So this is uh, where Mr. Koran ended the presentation when uh, the operating expenditures were presented um, during last Thursday board, board workshop. So starting with this, um, our, cap our actual capital spending has been on the rise. Our planned investment for the next fiscal year is expected to be nearly 90% higher than our current fiscal year. This may sound ambitious, but the details paint a different picture. As they get into the details, um, you'll understand um, better what, what, what is going to happen in the next few years in terms of capital improvement plan. So let's take a look at the CIP program update. Okay, so um, today, um, first few slides, I'll go over CIP process and some housekeeping information. This is uh, for the benefit of the uh, members of the public um, and also as a refresher for uh, those who are very aware of our CIP um, process. And then later part of the presentation, um, I'll go through the highlights of the proposed CIP. 
the CAP updates will be presented in progression. I'll start with general 25 year plan overview and um, uh, dive into summary of our 10 year changes and then wrap up, the, wrap up the presentation on capital improvement plan with some key capital investments proposed for the next two years. While I go through these updates, I'll also point out some key changes from the prior CIP. As most of you are aware, we always start with the last um, adapted CIP uh, budget and then make updates to that. Okay, uh, in a nutshell, our CIP is a financial representation of the district's priorities both short-term and long-term. Our long-range plan addresses the district's capital needs and expenditures for the next 25 years. And um, we have a two-year budget cycle that prioritizes our capital projects based on our system needs and operational impacts and identify funding necessary to implement these capital projects. So we also have use a CAP database that is built in-house by our own staff um, to capture the CAP updates on an annual basis. And um, this, will, this is to ensure that we are capturing any variations or deviations in a timely manner. Additionally, um, this will become an input to the financial planning model and the financial planning model will give us guidance in terms of any fiscal constraints uh, that should be incorporated into our CIP plan. Okay. So this is a very high, high level overview of our CIP program. Uh, see our CIP is a very comprehensive plan. It incorporates projects and programs to meet district strategic goals and also our integrated resources plan. Um, our capital projects are prioritized for strategic spending to address some critical infrastructure needs. Uh, this is accomplished by incorporating some additional studies um, done within the district. Uh, one is our CIP engineering report. This is a 10 year overview of our priorities for the district uh, to enhance, um, to improve supply and infrastructure reliability and sustainability. And additionally, we also look at some operational uh, capital expenditures, including projects that are necessary to meet regulatory requirements or emerging requirements, and also to maintain our life cycle maintenance of assets. And we look at our facilities assessments that will guide us towards what is the condition and age of our current facilities and what kind of improvements we would need in the next 25 years. And we also look at additional studies and assessments. So that uh, encompasses our um, capital improvement plan. And additionally, the, uh, this become an input to the financial planning model um, in addition to our operating expenditures. And again, uh, based on the results of the financial model, we'll tweak in the budgets as necessary to ensure that we are within the uh, financial constraints um, and ensure that um, uh, the, 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 the rate impacts are um, affordable. And, and that information is taken back to the CIP implement plan and the cycle continues. So this is a, um, a, a picture of our financial planning model later in the presentation. Um, there will be more details presented about that, but uh, the message here, the bottom line is, our proposed CIP for 2020 is within the limits of the financial planning model. Okay, so before digging into the details, uh, here is the context. For this specific mid-cycle, we have not added any new projects or, or excluded any projects from our CIP program. And we have made some changes to our project estimates and milestone schedules, uh, mostly focusing on the near-term implementation. As an improvement to the process, um, we also explored some cost estimating tools and piloted a cost catalog for specific projects and programs. And that has been incorporated into this mid-cycle update, but otherwise no major changes were made. And um, just as a reminder, this was already discussed before last Thursday, our investment for 2000, fiscal year 18 and 19 was 26 and 19 and 20 was um, around 29, um, I think which is nearly 70 to 80% of our adapted budget. 
And also I would want to point out that um, resource evaluation was not completed as part of this mid-cycle um, update um, because resource evaluation is a typical um, for mid-cycle update. Um, so this would be uh, a comprehensive evaluation will be conducted during our two year budget cycle. Okay, so you probably have all seen the CIP spreadsheet that was provided as a handout um, last week. And uh, this is just a summary of um, everything that was included in that CIP spreadsheet, very high level CIP overview. Um, and uh, please note that this includes customer jobs, extraordinary expenditures, and FIF, FRF funding, and um, additional funding and customer jobs. And um, looking at this uh, high level overview, as you notice that in the two year program, our investment um, has reduced, our expected investment has reduced by 15%. Uh, but over 10 year horizon and 25 year horizon, it's going to be um, increased by 6% and 4%, which is insignificant considering the overall program here. Um, the, the expenditure, the finances are like karma, the underspending from prior years will come back to reward us in the coming years. That's what we are seeing on this uh, snapshot of our CIP overview. Okay. So I'll, I'll highlight some of the um, adjustments that we have made to um, our five large programs. This is our prior year budget, and um, I have identified the totals for 10 years for some of these large programs um, because our 10 year costs have greater influence on rates. So we were at 993 million um, for 25 year last year, and then our 10 year was 421. Your no, is, oh, there we go. Okay. Okay, so this is our proposed budget for this year um, for the entire 25 year program and 10 year. So, in our proposed budget, we'll be crossing a billion dollar investment mark over a 25 year horizon. And uh, some of the changes that were made, adjustments made to these large programs, main renewal. Uh, some slight adjustment to the program, and we have storage improvements. Um, those are going into the design, so we have a little bit more details in terms of what those projects look like. So there is slight increase in that program and fish passage. Um, there is a slight increase there, but uh, this increase is not related to any change um, to, to the project. It's um, purely because of some um, delays in invoicing and payment. So the payment that was that didn't happen last year has um, been shifted to next year. Otherwise, um, no major changes to fish passage project. And our meter replacements and customer jobs remain same. And AMI, uh, there was already some discussion on that. There is some uh, increase on AMI project as well. Rekha, may I ask a question here? Yes, sir. When you... Um... Uh, forecast your uh, CIP requirements. Does that include uh, consulting and outside resources too? For yes, example, that, for example, EMA. That's correct. This includes consulting services and any outside services, district labor and um, construction costs. Everything uh, that you would see as part of the capital project is uh, incorporated into these budgets. So the AMI figure here is off by about $9 million. Uh, that is because um, what you are seeing um, under 50 includes operating budgets, but what is captured here is only related to capital. That's why I'm asking the question, does it include the consulting and outside services? like design engineering? Because that's all capital, so that's uh, included in under AMI, but any operating budget, so the next 20 year life cycle, those are not incorporated under under this um, budget item. Right, so uh, Director Sethi, uh, for example, I think there was about an $11 million contract with Badger included last week for the ongoing um, network as a service 
support services uh, related to the, the cellular use of the cellular network. And so those costs specifically would not be factored in here and are included in the operating budget. Okay, now I understand. Thank you very much for the clarification. Okay, if there are no additional questions, I'll move on to the next slide. This is um, another um, snapshot of our CIP budget, looking at our five-year overview and drill down to um, what is what we're going to see in the immediate future in the next five years. This includes only general fund portion of the budget, including FIF, FRF, but excludes customer jobs. And the, the effort um, stayed the same in terms of the number of projects and related scope. Uh, one reason um, for the change um, in the, in the budget numbers is because there is a shift in milestones and um, the underspent or the savings from prior years are actually shifted into future years, hence the increase in um, budget for future years. And also, as I mentioned before, there were some changes to cost estimates to reflect true, true costs and market changes. Just highlights on some of the major changes um, that happened during the mid-cycle update. Um, as I mentioned, so some adjustments were made to, the, to our main renewal program to stay within our 10 million per year objective. And uh, revised AMI costs are based on the proposals that we have received. And also we have revised the near-term projects to, in, to reflect engineers' estimates and um, true market changes. Okay, so here is a chart um, showing the 25-year plan the key takeaways here are, number one, um, in, the in the near term, we are looking at for the next three years, we are looking at $60 million per investment on average. And then if you look at the out, year, uh, out years, our average investment is going to shift back to our, our normal investments um, that we have been seeing, which is 24 million per year. And we do have some exceptions in the out years, uh, one exception is uh, in year 31, 32, 30, 31, uh, that's uh, because of a placeholder project related to Mission San Jose water treatment plant improvements. And then in 41, 42, there is another placeholder project for water reclamation phase one, uh, including that project. Um, the budget for 41, 42 brings the estimate to $150 million, but what you see on this chart, it's actually out of the chart. The to total budget for that year is expected to be 151. And then for 42 um, and 43, uh, we have added a new um, AMI replacement project, um, considering that we have, we currently know that the financial life cycle of AMI um, is going to be 20 years, so we added a placeholder in the next 20 years uh, to capture future replacements. Okay, so this is our big picture 25 year CIP, um, which is nearly $1 billion. So we have about 90% of our CIP is supporting our district strategic goals one and two. And the remaining 10% is actually um, due to other goals uh, within our strategic plan and also to support um, other projects and initiatives. So you can see most, uh, more than 60% is providing reliability, uh, infrastructure reliability, um, and supporting our goal one cost effectiveness and value, which is um, adding by improving our infrastructure reliability, we are val adding value to our customers. And then uh, goal number two, which is water supply, nearly 30% of our capital budget is allocated for water supply, um, which um, provides supply reliability for our existing customer and future generations. So the bottom line from this chart, our CIP priorities and budgets are perfectly aligned with the district strategic plan and objectives. Okay, this is um, another view of um, our CIP program uh, related to uh, reliability. 60% of our CIP expenditures um, will improve reliability, and that, that includes environmental sustainability, seismic reliability, 
uh, operational production, and the majority of this goes to system reliability. And then we have additional 30% for water supply and water quality enhancements, and um, additional 10% for CIP customer jobs that has uh, no impact on rates. The next slide, I will uh, touch on some of those projects that are under other category. Okay, so here is another snapshot of um, our funding source, our CAP program by funding source. This is again our 25 year plan and 68% um, of our um, proposed budget goes towards um, impacts our um, rates. And then 30, 30, nearly 32% of our CAP budget um, have no influence on rates. It's completely funded by uh, development related charges. Okay, now uh, we'll go into a 10 year um, summary details. Um, so far we have been looking at the 25 year program and then looking at the 10 year program. This provides um, an overview of the program by um, project category. Some of the larger programs are incorporated in, on this chart. A quarter of the CIP budget is again allocated for our main renewal program over the next 10 years. And, and one third of that budget um, is also allocated for other large programs, including fish passage, AMI storage improvements and service line and meter replacements. And 30% of the, of the budget is um, allocated for other capital and 10% for customer jobs. Okay, here are some key projects um, that are part of our other category, um, just to give you um, an overview of what is included in our other category. Um, some of our water supply projects are part of that 30% category and our well pump replacements, these are necessary uh, um, infrastructure improvements that are um, necessary to operate the district. And we do have some electrical upgrades, PLC and SCADA improvements in, incorporated in our CIP for the next 10 years. Um, and additional um, equipment tools and vehicle capitals uh, that are necessary to run the district. And we also have um, a small portion of the budget allocated for our IT projects. Okay, so this chart is um, depicting record high investments over the next two years. Couple of reasons for this. Major or uh, multiple large projects and programs will be moving into construction in the next, um, next year or so. Um, as you all know, large investments happen during construction phase. So that's why you see a significant increase um, in our estimated budgets um, for the next two years, two to three years. And these programs, um, fish passage is already in construction. Um, we are halfway through, and then we, we do um, expect to take AMI into implementation phase and then main renewal projects. We do have multiple projects, uh, very critical projects that will be going into construction um, in, in the next couple of years. So that is the reason for the increase in budget for these two years and then the budgets will uh, normalize after that. And also you notice that for the main renewal program, then although the investment goal for our program is 10 million per year, but some years will see greater than 10 million investment because of the same uh, reason that some projects in construction um, phase will see um, larger investments. Um, and then we have adjusted the main renewal program to ensure that the overall program for the next 10 years will stay within our targeted average of 10 million range. And staff understands that there is a need to revisit the main renewal program objectives and budget targets uh, with additional consideration to materials and um, our current standards. And maybe we have to look at resetting the goals. Uh, staff will come back to the board with a uh, revised uh, plan and recommendation on that program. And um, this is um, just a highlight of um, all the critical major main renewal projects um, that staff is currently working on. And um, these are key main renewal projects. 
and a couple of projects will be going into construction in the next couple of weeks. Um, that would be Alvarado Niles, um, as you're familiar with that project, that's a seismic uh, improvement project. And also a, a segment of the small diameter project will be going into construction pretty soon. And the other two critical projects on this list are Driscoll and Central Newark. Um, they are currently in design and uh, they're expected to go into construction in the next fiscal year. Victor, this is Judy. I have a question. So what's the cost for the huge jump in budget for Central Newark? Yes, um, that's actually, um, these projects are complex projects and they're, they're, they're multiple, um, there are multiple phases within these um, projects. So our original estimates for main renewals um, are somewhat disconnected with true market and also the unit estimates um, weren't a true representation of some large projects. So these are complex projects with, um, these are not simple um, open trench um, construction. Um, so therefore there are multiple phases involved in this project. Now that we are looking at the recent bids that we have received, we have noticed the increase in the um, unit estimates. And also these are, as I mentioned, these are not true representation of a typical main replacement program. These are very complex projects. And that's the reason for the increase. Okay, so is an actual increase is not due to a delayed in project initiation. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. So this is our storage um, program implementation. Again, um, another view of what projects are included in our storage program. Um, we have one project that, uh, that is close to com completion in terms of construction and this project will go into service in the next few weeks. Um, and then the other projects that are identified on this list, um, we have initiated the design on these projects. Um, and um, the good thing is the way the CIP is lined up is that after we are done with the construction of the first line, the programs that including our fish passage projects and AMI will be moving into construction phase on these storage improvements uh, that we are um, working on the design to line them up uh, right after the first phase of implementation is completed. Okay, so here is a um, list of a subset of um, all the fun projects that staff will be working on in the next fiscal year. This list only includes 17 of the 96 projects planned for next year. And uh, these 17 include the projects that are greater than $500,000. Um, although the list appears to be a small portion of the CIP plan projects, in reality, these 17 projects contribute to 85% of our total CIP budget for the next fiscal year. And as you can see, the top uh, four programs contribute to 75% of the CIP for this year. Um, those were highlighted, the, um, the fish passage and main renewals are, are highlighted on this um, slide. And we also have advanced metering infrastructure and um, service line emergency replacement program. All these add up to nearly 75% of our budget for the next fiscal year. And then similarly, this is our list of projects greater than $500,000 mm -hmm. for fiscal year 21 and 22. As you can see, some of these large programs remain same because those are multi-year programs. Um, and a fish passage program will be in third year. So we'll be wrapping up construction on that program. And then main renewal program is a long running program. It's going to continue uh, for some time. Um, and then advanced metering infrastructure is also a multi-year program. So you see budgets assigned for that. And then we do have some individual projects um, that are on this list. And as the highlighted projects are already committed and uh, in the implementation phase, I think the higher investment targets for the next two years um, is justified. With this, um, I can take any questions Are there any questions or comments from the board? Uh, John Weed. Director Weed. A graph which I think would be informative because um, just to uh, put us in context would be to show what our percentage of execution has been in past years. This all looks forward. And, and that is significantly improved by the time during the time I've been on the board. Um, 
Robert Schaefer is head of engineering, did an extraordinary job in upping it. But there was a time in my tenure when the finance department refused to accept the estimates by the engineering department in their budget because they felt they were overly optimistic. And our execution year in and year out was running at times less than 50%. So um, I think that would be helpful to see, uh, to look at, see how we're doing, what our past experience has been and what track we're on. Uh, the second is to try and to whatever we can do to look at multi years because these projects have a tendency to roll over into the following year and coming up with a multi year estimate as opposed to a single annual estimate may give um, a better picture of what our real experience is. So those are rhetorical comments. Thank you. Thank you, Director Wee. Director Sethi? Yes. Uh, Rekka, could you uh, describe what the service line emergency replacement program is? So um, that's an emergency program. A um, lot of times uh, we do have failures related to our service laterals. And um, currently we don't have a specific program for service uh, line replacement. So we do have um, allocated budget uh, to take care of these emergency replacements. So every time there is a uh, break in the service laterals, uh, so this budget would be used to fix those uh, service line um, breaks or leaks. And so, this is, um, <clears throat> this would be part of our main renewal program for our planned projects. Um, we are also replacing the service, um, service lines. However, that's not sufficient because those have a tendency to break um, earlier than our larger main. So that's why this program is necessary to capture those emergency replacements. And we want, we, we, we are capturing the, are forecasting the future emergency replacement costs through the capital program. So this will be in the engineering budget year in, year out moving forward. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Director Gunther. Any questions or comments? No, but um, I, I think the concept of the multi-year being added, uh, perhaps um, we could just add it uh, in the, let's say like for the rubber dam fish ladder, the project cost, maybe in like a parentheses or something in the title area so that there's a reference that we could look at and say, okay, well, Shins Pond fish screen estimate total cost and then what we're going to be using in that year just a suggestion that was it thank, thank you. you director akbari any comments or questions nothing from my end right now thank you thank you and i'll open the floors up to our members of the public do i have any questions or comments from our public members i see a hand mr nishimura thank you uh President Huang and Rekka, that was a nice presentation. It's uh, heartening to see that the district is continuing to invest in its infrastructure. Uh, one piece of information which would be useful to help understand the capital program uh, would be including a lifetime uh, to each of the components. Uh, for example, you have lumped in vehicle replacement, which is capital, along with, for example, AMI and the fiscal passage. But each of those components have a very different lifetime. For example, I would expect that the vehicles that you purchase under this capital program would have a lifetime of five to seven years, while uh, AMI, we understand from last week's presentation, is a 20-year pr program. And I would expect that the fish passage uh, would last, hopefully, 30 years or, 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 or more. Um, and that would enable us to understand sort of the annualized cost, the amortized cost of each of these, right? Because I would expect, um, it, you know, that would, that, yeah, I mean, that would enable a sort of a, a translation of the capital cost to an equivalent running operating cost or replacement cost. That's all, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Do I have any other members of the public that wish to address the board or have questions? Okay, seeing none, Rita, shall we move on? 
Yes, um, with this, uh, this wraps up the capital portion of the presentation and I will hand over this to uh, Mr. Om and I'll stop sharing right here and thank you everyone. Thank you. Let me share my screen. You know, I don't know if others here will share this idea with me, but we know inevitably we're going to have a major quake on the Hayward Fault. And it might be uh, prudent on our part to just year to year, and as we forecast out, we, <clears throat> we know based on our 2008 study, the number of uh, main breaks we can see in the system, right? 1500 or more. So it might be good just to have a tracking number that's kind of hidden in the background that says, hey, if that event occurs, here's how much we could expect to be spending uh, within a, let's say a two, three year period of time to recover from that quake. Um, Bob, how do you feel about that? Um, well, we know from the study that we performed several years ago um, what the anticipated um, number of main breaks were. And over the years since then, we've implemented projects that reduce the um, uh, sort of the, the, the get customers back in service time significantly. Um, so that's that's information that we can put together. Um, but are you asking for uh, staff to kind of come up with rough cost estimates for uh, say what it would take to do 500 main repairs or something like that? Yeah, something, something like that. And if we had a uh, engineering number to work with on what we think the uh, recovery cost would be, well, we know what our emergency fund is in, uh, from finance, and we know uh, uh, the emergency funds we can exercise through JP Morgan. So uh, over time, that's going, perhaps we will have to relook at our uh, bucket for emergency on, on our, um, in finance, and then also maybe we have to think about other ways of financing uh, a recovery. Mm -hmm. um, so one big assumption that we would have to deal with is um, in these, these this assumption, how much federal funding, you know, would or state funding would we expect to help offset those costs too? Um, so that's something that we can look at and. The last time that the, um, the board completed its strategic plan, worked on it in 2017, um, we kind of finalized the report in 2018. It's a five-year plan. I was hoping that we would get three years out of it um, before we have to kind of look at it in, in a comprehensive way. Um, it's, it's starting to feel like um, we're starting to receive you know, significant new ideas and suggestions from the board. So. Um, I'm starting to think that um, this might be something over the next year or so or two years that we want to get back into the strategic planning business because this would be a huge um, strategic decision. You know, by, by the board, it's a huge financial strategic decision. So um, we'll take a, a preliminary look and then uh, we can bring this to committee in terms of what our assessment is on uh, whether we can um, kind of tackle this as a sort of plan. Yeah, Bob, it's not a commitment of dollars. It's mm -hmm. uh, more of a planning tool for the future uh, for what we know is a net inevitable. Right. And I would also ask that uh, perhaps we talk to East Bay Mud about uh, what they're doing for that, that major quake. I know from talking to a couple of board members uh, <clears throat> that uh, there's been some work in the background on mm -hmm. that, already going back 20 years, by the way. Yeah, so um, my suggestion is let us take a, a, the first look at 
um, progress to date on implementing the mitigation measures that uh, were recommended in our seismic improvement uh, plan and see how uh, we have uh, made, uh, I think the, actually, I think the board will be pleased to see that although we have a ton of um, vulnerability still, we've made measurable progress in terms of those mitigations. And we'll bring that back to committee and then uh, we could probably do some sort of back of the envelope uh, cost um, you know, per repair and, and calculate that out. So we can do something like that as a little side effort. Mm -hmm. But in terms of addressing it, to me, you're going to see that the number is going to be so huge on the cost that um, that sounds like an overall district kind of strategic planning decision. I agree. Yeah. Um, um, uh, interesting concept, and I've, I've been kind of thinking in the back of my head, I'm like, you know, over the last five years, we've actually made some pretty good progress on a lot of these recommendations, and, and, the, and the capital improvement program that Reka just presented includes one of the most um, important, uh, 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 important elements of that, which is the Alvarado Niles pipeline, which um, I'm really happy to see moving forward and going into construction. Uh, John, we suggested it might be it would be appropriate for us to have a line item in our capital improvement pro program for contingency uh, planning and uh, acquisition of material, critical materials for um, response to a major incident, and that could include some land for marshalling area that we could store the uh, these components on. I recall Walt Wadlow stating that in Santa Clara, they had some very uh, complicated uh, connectors that they had made as spares and buried in sand. So then if they did have an event and that they had a critical failure, they had the, uh, the item there, they would not have to go out and specially fabricate it. So um, a documentation of what, what our expectations are, what our recovery requirements would be and the type of equipment and materials we need could be developed and should be developed and then see how much of it we can put on a capital budget. Gosh, it's really sounding like the uh, strategic plan shelf life is getting shorter and shorter here. Um, I think those are some interesting ideas. Perhaps we should take some of those ideas into committee and flush it out some more. But for now, shall we more move on to the financial planning model? One quick retort is that the contingency planning uh, study needs to be worked on as well, which is being done now. And hopefully out of that will come some guidance for the strategic plan. Yeah, you are correct. We are developing the business continuity plan. All right. Um, so Mr. Alm is experiencing some technical difficulties with sharing his screen. So um, hopefully you can all see the, the presentation now as I'm sharing it. Uh, but, but he will go ahead and, and lead us through the different metrics comparing the adopted to the proposed amended budget. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wanderlick. Can you see me visually? Yes. Oh, perfect. <laughs> I, I do experience some uh, difficulty here. Uh, again, thank you, Mr. Wanderlich, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, uh, President Wong, member of the board. Um, as John mentioned, I'm Sidney Alm. I'm the supervising financial analyst uh, for the district. So before we get into the financial planning uh, scenario, which is the highlight of, the, of the, my presentation, um, just wanted to go over the, some of the key metrics uh, that we typically show the board um, during the budget process. Uh, this is, these are the metrics from our um, financial planning model. Uh, and I wanted to highlight some key changes uh, that were made uh, since the board adopted uh, the two-year budget um, in June 2019. And now we're in the amended budget. So these are, these are the key changes. Um, staff have reviewed the water resources staff, looked at the, um, <clears throat> the demand forecast, and we increased the water demand um, projection uh, to 35 million gallon per day uh, for the current fiscal year and the next uh, fiscal year 2021. Uh, the district's long-term uh, uh, projection still remains at 34 million gallon per day. Uh, staff anticipates that uh, the land sales to happen a couple of years down the road, 
Uh, this is based on the, the updated market condition and a real estate transaction for this kind of a, a property. So the revenue associated with that um, is shifted to fiscal year 23-24. Um, the water purchase costs uh, reflect the updated um, rates from San Francisco Water, uh, meaning uh, which includes no increase for the next two fiscal year. Um, and they also include the additional uh, water purchase costs that the board approved the last month in April. Uh, based on our uh, latest actuarial evaluation um, performed uh, by a new actuary, um, the district will, uh, is anticipated to save approximately $3 million um, in annual contribution for, for our pension and OPEB. Uh, this is through uh, the end of June uh, 2032. This is based on a 12-year a schedule that the board um, had set for us. I'm happy to announce that the uh, staff had successfully secured uh, an additional four and a half million dollars in new grants uh, for our uh, fist passage projects um, that's going on right now in Alameda Creek. So the, um, the amended budget uh, show, uh, um, shows that there's an increase in CIP. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ipagunta uh, indicated earlier, uh, we're comparing the adopted budget to what we are proposing as the amended budget, um, there's an increase and through the um, $9 million in uh, projects is added um, over the next uh, nine year period. Uh, one of the key uh, metrics that we look at um, to determine the uh, financial health of the district is the general fund balances and, and our focus um, for the discussion this afternoon is gonna be looking at that. Um, just to touch on the, the, the overall uh, general fund balances, um, when the board adopted the budget, um, um, the, the low year, when we look at the nine year horizon, um, the low year uh, for the general fund ending fund balance is in fiscal year 22-23. Uh, and the low uh, balance at that point, uh, $67.8 million, which is uh, 5.2 uh, 5 million above the reserve target. Now with the amended uh, budget with a uh, combination of revenue, operating expenses, and, and a higher, higher estimated year in balance for the current fiscal year. And uh, Mr. Karam spoke about this in detail in the last presentation. Um, the amended budget will, uh, will have uh, the low year um, in fiscal year 23-24. And um, the ending balance um, in that particular year is $83.5 million. That's $19 million above the, uh, the board target. Thank you. This is the, um, so here's the general funding balances. So all of uh, the next several slides will compare the amended uh, budget to the adopted budget. Um, the red line here shows the policy target and the orange bar represent the, both the actuals for the prior year and the um, estimated um, ending balances uh, in the out years. Um, as I mentioned earlier, just briefly, the, the amended budget um, has the low year in fiscal year 2024, um, showing the low year there. Um, it's still $19 million above the reserve target. Um, the chart below the adopted budget, again, uh, as I mentioned, the low year is in fiscal year 2023, and that is closer to the target. It's only uh, 5.2 million. Um, above targets. So overall, um, the amended budget um, ending balances are, are trending uh, higher than the adopted budget. This is the water, well, the debt coverage ratios um, you know, for over the nine year period, which show in the nine year period, that's kind of more realistic um, and is what the board is, is used to, to seeing. Uh, so the red line represent uh, the policy target the board set a policy target that uh, the district needs to maintain. Uh, debt coverage ratios at 200%. Um, that's above our bond covenant, uh, which is only requiring 1.25. Um, but our, uh, the district um, has a very high um, debt coverage ratios, as you can see. Um, it's over 600% right now um, in, the, in the amended budget. So um, this, is the, this is one of the reasons why um, the district credit, uh, credit rating is uh, AAA because of uh, the debt service coverage ratio. 
this is um, <clears throat> showing um, the uh, revenues, uh, comparing the operating revenues versus the operating expenses, including depreciation. So we break it down. We just want to show, okay, let's look at operating revenues as compared to um, operating expenses, um, ignoring um, other funding sources. Um, so at budget uh, adoption, uh, there's some, some, uh, there's some uh, budget uh, gap, the funding gap in the out year and fiscal year 2023. Um, but the amended budget uh, shows that the operating revenues will fully cover uh, or annual operating expenses, including depreciation. So what, that's what that, that this metric shows. Um, this is the rate revenue versus revenue requirement. Um, again, uh, dialing in to more specifically in touch with rate revenues. Uh, these are revenues derived from uh, a water sales. And the revenue requirement um, are, are our total uh, O&M expenses uh, plus debt service. Uh, so this, this metric shows two things. Uh, one, uh, that our uh, rate revenues uh, are sufficient to cover the O&M expenses um, and, and the debt service. Uh, but when, when we added the general fund CIP, uh, shown in the, the, the blue bar uh, there, uh, the, the red line kind of fall below. And, and that's because the district uh, needs uh, additional funding from other sources that is not um, derived from water sales uh, to, to, to fill the funding gap. And those uh, revenue sources come from property tax, um, grants and reimbursement, interest income, and other revenues. Uh, with that, um, the uh, rate revenue uh, fully cover and, and other revenue sources fully cover the um, revenue requirement. This is just a summary of the uh, capital improvement program. Rego spoke to this already. Um, what this shows is just different funding sources. And so the district's uh, capital improvement program are funded by multiple funding sources. The majority uh, is the general fund, um, but the, the program is also funded by the facility improvement fund, um, as well as the facility renewal fund. Um, the little pink uh, box there is a potential uh, debt issuance for the AMI. Um, uh, for this particular, uh, the status quo scenario that is uh, $14.5 million. All right, so uh, last year, when we presented the two-year budget to the board, uh, we talked about how we're generally pretty conservative with our budgeting and financial planning. Uh, you know, something I think you've heard Mr. Shaver mention a number of times is there are two things we can't run out of as a water district, uh, water and money. And as a result, we tend to be intentionally conservative in our planning related to both. And so, um, when we talked to the board last year, we said, okay, well, what are, let's say our financial performance exceeds budget. Uh, what are some things that we may want to do if we have some flexibility? And so uh, what we've done is, is we've modeled a few different scenarios so the board can see what it looks like. And, uh, you know, the, the kind of status quo scenario, which kind of maintains reserves above target. Uh, but there are other adjustments we might want to consider making in our financial planning, uh, whether that's related to COVID-19 and, and revenue impacts, uh, whether it's, you know, our consideration of what we want our next rate increase to look like, or, or if there is a rate increase next fiscal year, you know, uh, the board continues to deliberate, deliberate about N3 Ranch. Um, there was nothing in the CIP for an acquisition of the ranch because no formal decision has been made yet. Uh, but you may be interested in seeing how ranch participation could affect our finances. You know, and lastly, uh, some of you may be concerned about the market volatility and what that means for our uh, pension and retiree health care trust funds and, and how those are performing. Um, you know, I can tell you that so far this fiscal year, CalPERS has actually earned a positive return in the range of about three and a half to four percent. Uh, because many of the losses uh, experienced uh, a couple of months ago in March have, have been recovered. And so when you compare the market status today back to July 1 of 19, it is actually up uh, modestly. 
uh, but we will uh, show some different scenarios. And actually the biggest long-term change in our financial planning model that provides us some of the flexibility in these different scenarios is the 3 million in annual savings on our pension and OPEP contributions for the latest actuarial valuation. Um, you know, getting four and a half million in grants is great and helpful, uh, but a one-time impact, whereas on the, the OPEP and, and pension contributions, it's three million every year. Uh, when we talked about what could potentially be done should there be funding available with the board at last year's budget workshop? There were a couple of other ideas that were mentioned, including potentially issuing less debt for AMI or uh, over time developing a more aggressive main renewal program. Uh, we have not modeled those specifically, uh, but I did just want to mention that those were options that were mentioned last year. And so with that overview, um, you know, we've seen this chart. This is the amended. Uh, actually, budget. Mr. Wunderlich, before we go into the different scenarios, I was going to ask if the directors have any comments on the data that was presented before in terms of the capital improvement program, the rate revenue charts. I am not hearing None from me. Okay. I sounds like I'm not hearing from anybody. Do we have any members of the public that wish to comment on the charts before we get into the scenarios? Mr. Nishimura. Uh, thank you, President Huang. Uh, I believe I made a, a comment at the last meeting um, based on some preliminary data that was shown. And I think this most recent presentation underscores that, which is it appears that the district is collecting more revenues than is necessary to deliver the service, which is its charter. Um, and you know, this is one danger of a multi-year uh, rate increase. You know, the district has recently moved from a annual rate setting process and you know commonly known as a prop 218 process to a multi-year and you know the prop 218 does require that the district collect no more than uh, revenues than is necessary to to perform its operations and you know based on what was presented you know it looks like uh, the district's uh, operating balance is, is substantially higher than its own, own target and I am concerned that, uh, and this is again based on Director Sethi's, what he claimed was a rhetorical comment from last week, you know, about you know, if I have $3 million extra a year due to OPEB savings, you know, can I go spend it? And you know, this goes hand in hand with another director's comment about uh, reverse engineering or uh, backing into a spending plan that, that happens to make the numbers turn out correctly. Um, you know, as a rate payer, uh, and I, you know, and I hope that the board represents the rate payers, uh, you know, if you have collected too much money, um, it is your obligation, both morally uh, and also under the law, to make sure that that situation is rectified without wasteful spending. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. And any other members of the public that wish to address the board at this point? I'm not seeing any hands and I do owe the board apologies. I disappear for a bit because my cat apparently decided to share my teacup and drink my tea. Um, anyway, with that, let's move on to the scenarios. All right, thank you, President Wong. Uh, President Wong, before we move on, I yes, don't believe sir. Director Weed is uh, in the meeting at the moment. Oh, no. It looks like he is now, he was an attendee and not a panelist for a short period of time, I noticed. Director Lee is still- uh, He's back to being a panelist. Thank you. Uh, President Wong? Yes, <clears throat> Director Sethi. So, you know, John and I have been on the finance committee for nine years. I think we understood very clearly uh, or understand very clearly uh, where 
our excess money is gone. You know, we're, we're not a for-profit organization that is distributing money out to shareholders or doing stock buybacks. If extra money has come in, it's gone into our capital account uh, in our general fund. And that money is going to be spent. Uh, we've had some projects deferred uh, over the last four years, but we are, as you can see from this presentation, we are now catching up at a accelerated pace. For much of the last two decades, we've been operating between four and six million dollars a year on CIP projects. <clears throat> and during the last four years, we've gone from four to eight to 15 to 25, 26 for this fiscal year. We're ramping up to over 50, 55 million for next year and over 70 million for the following year. This is unprecedented in the district's history that we are ramping up at this pace. So all that money that's sitting there in the pot, in the general fund, is now going to be spent down. What we did is we built up a head of steam for these projects that were forthcoming. Were certain projects delayed? Yes. Did the money end up in our general fund? Yes. But if you look at uh, uh, the general fund, I believe we have somewhere around $75 million just in the capital account. So that money is going to be spent down and uh, uh, you know, over the next four years, and so we're not hoarding money for for any uh, mysterious project out there uh, to try to try and fund something. So I just wanted to make that really clear for everybody. Thank you for your I, comment. I think all the data that was presented over the last two budget workshops here illustrates that very clearly. Thank you for your comments. I think now we're all back. I think we should move on to the scenario. All right, thank you, President Wong. So uh, this again is just a reminder of what the general fund any balances look like based on the amended budget uh, with all of the status quo assumptions. And so with that, I will turn it over uh, back to Mr. Allen to walk us through the various scenarios and how they may affect our uh, general fund balances. All right. Could make a quick comment on something that prior to going into this, which I think more I could summarize at the end. I wrote a memo um, to follow up on Director Sethi's earlier comments that pointed out the, the what the re, if impacts were of the disconnect in our rate structure not matching for fixed costs with fixed income and variable cost with variable incomes. So when you have a drought, you're have, you're leveraged when you sell more water. To the upside, you're leveraged. You're penalized dramatically when you have the downsize during a drought or other uh, loss in water sales to conservation. That instability requires that you maintain a much larger reserve and a much more conservative budget or you'd be whipsawed. During the last drought over three years, we lost $60 million in revenue that we had to make up. And but for a change in our fixed costs, it would have been $80 million. We've been through it. I'm not sure what we learned. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. But this is the financial planning workshop that's focused on that. There will be appropriate time to talk about race structure. But thank you. Moving on. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wanderlich, again. Uh, so the next several slides uh, will show the financial planning models, uh, scenarios um, of the potential impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we will highlight four scenarios. Um, obviously, there's more, but we want to highlight these four scenarios. Uh, scenario one is a 20% decline in commercial water consumption over the next two fiscal year. Um, scenario two is a 50% decline in development activity in the service area. Um, the third scenario is both a 20% decline in the commercial water consumption and a 50% decline in uh, development activity. Uh, a fourth scenario um, uh, is a one-year rate holiday, uh, effective March 1st, uh, 2021. Um, I just wanted to note that a report published by AWWA 
uh, indicates that many water um, agencies across the country are considering uh, rate deferral uh, because of the pandemic. So here's again the- uh, Sydney, uh, can I ask a, a quick question on the previous slide? Sure, sir. So um, scenarios one and two, uh, how are the percentage declines chosen? Um, is it kind of arbitrary and our best guess, or is there some data behind that? Yeah, I, I guess I can try to tackle that. It's, it's actually um, fairly arbitrary just to give us a sense of what it looks like if we do observe this. So far, um, we haven't seen anything that makes us think that this will happen, uh, but it is a risk. Um, you know, we have seen, a, a, I think, a modest reduction in our commercial demand in the last month or two. But at this point, it seems to be offset by increases in residential demand. So there's not really a net impact to district revenues. So this is more of a, just trying to show some sensitivity to the board of what it could look like if we experience these things. And can you uh, just jog my memory on where construction activity currently stands? Because... Uh, I know for a, a portion of time, uh, construction activity was completely paused locally. Has that, uh, are, are we back to normal on construction activity or is there still a, a moratorium on, on certain activity there? Yeah, so the latest order from the public health officer allows construction as long as you're complying with certain protocols uh, to keep the construction side as safe as possible. But uh, I think Mr. Stevenson can perhaps um, provide more information in particular as it relates to any of our ongoing development projects. Yeah, so after the revised order came out, we did see a sharp increase in activity, development activity. Um, it's not going as fast as it was prior to the, uh, the first order, just because of um, the various restrictions in place in, in terms of um, site compliance with construction safety protocols and so forth. But it is definitely um, ramping back up um, fairly robustly right now. Okay, thank and, you. And uh, before uh, the pandemic, development activity was actually going at a much faster rate than uh, we had projected in the budget. So, so even with a slow, a modest slowdown, it could still be within our budget expectations. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. I'll turn it back to Sydney. Okay, thank you. So this, uh, this is a scenario, again, showing the general fund ending balances um, compared to the status quo. The status quo is um, our amended, uh, proposed amended budget. Still with a 20 year, 20% uh, I'm sorry, decline in, um, in uh, commercial water use. Uh, this will result in a cumulative revenue loss of $5.8 million over the next two fiscal years. So. The next couple of scenarios, I'll mention um, the, the revenue impact and as well as the, the low year uh, balance. Those are the key numbers that we want to we to focus on. Uh, so for this scenario, uh, the low balance, uh, as I mentioned before, is in fiscal year 2024, uh, shown on, on the chart there at, at the top. Uh, this is the, so the ending balance um, in 2024 is $77.8 million. Uh, this is still uh, $13.3 million above our target. Um, so the district, uh, in our opinion, can weather this scenario uh, with a 20% decline um, in commercial uh, water use if it were to, to, to occur. This next scenario is the 50% decline in development activity. Now, um, again, uh, the, the low balance here shown on the chart is in fiscal year 2024 at about $77.4 million, um, about $13 million above target as well. The revenue impact uh, for this particular scenario, again, if it were to occur, is a $5.3 million over the next uh, two fiscal years. With, uh, with a scenario that um, with a 20% decline in commercial water use, uh, plus a 50% decline in our development activity in the service area, the revenue impact uh, for both uh, those scenario um, equal $11.1 million um, uh, to the general fund. 
Um, and the low, the low balance year is again in fiscal year 2024, that's kind of the key year out there um, at about $72 million. Uh, that's, that's about $7 million above target. Um, with this scenario, if we were to assume uh, foregoing the, the assumed rate increase of 3% um, in fiscal year, uh, for fiscal year 2021, we'll forego that rate increase uh, the revenue impact is a reduction uh, to the general fund in the tune of $3.4 million. Um, um, obviously, with the uh, compounding effects, because the rate um, the percent increase will be compounded. Uh, the low balance is here. Uh, there are two years uh, with the low balance, uh, both in fiscal year uh, 24 and fiscal year 25 at $71 million. Um, that, that's uh, still at $7.5 million um, above uh, the target and 6.3. Uh, million above target in fiscal year 2025. Um, again, the status quo uh, uh, target, uh, this, the status quo low balance um, is in fiscal year 2024 at 83.5 million. And just to clarify that, that still assumes that we maintain the three-year rate increase in the out years after the next fiscal year, correct? That's correct. Okay. So this scenario um, is a combination of all three. So if we were to assume 20% decline in commercial water use, 50% uh, decline in development activity, and forego just the one year um, a rate increase uh, for fiscal year 2021, um, the revenue impact is more significant. A, a total um, $14.5 million over the next two fiscal year. Um, as you see on the chart at the very top, uh, with these uh, three scenario, uh, the low balances are in uh, fiscal year 24-25, um, uh, but the balances are below uh, the reserve target. Uh, for fiscal year 2024, that's about $4 million below, and uh, in the following fiscal year, it's close to $6 million below uh, the target. Um, with this scenario, um, it would be fiscally challenging uh, for the district. Yeah, if I could make a quick comment on the past, uh, John Weed. The rate structure, one of my favorite terms, of 70% commodity, which is 350% above our cost, is far, makes us far more vulnerable to shifts in the commercial use than we are with the residential. The commercial is actually somewhat subsidizing the residential. But if there is a decline or increase, we get a disproportionate return on our um, revenues. And it's one of the challenges of trying to do budgeting and planning when you have fact various factors that are not tied to use, they have uh, leverage. And this is one of those leverage points. Thank you. Okay, so the next uh, few slides will show the financial planning model scenarios related to the M3 ranch. So we, um, there's two scenarios presented um, this afternoon. The first scenario is a purchase at the listing price of $68 million uh, plus an annual operating um, and maintenance expenses of $2 million. Now with this scenario, uh, we're assuming it's going to be 100% uh, funded uh, by debt issuance. Um, as well as uh, we're assuming that with the purchase, uh, the AMI project would be 100% funded uh, by the uh, state revolving fund loan um, and with the full amount of $39.5 million. The second scenario is a $5 million cash contribution um, towards a partnership purchase uh, with $1 million in annual uh, O&M expenses. And as highlighted and noted there, this is for illustrative purposes only. Um, the final purchase price or the contribution uh, obviously would be subject to negotiation. So with the purchase scenario, again, uh, talking about the low balance for the general fund, ending fund balance looking out um, to, through fiscal year 2026, uh, the low balance is in fiscal year 2025 at $76 million. Um, uh, this is uh, still 10 and a half million above target. Uh, again, we're comparing to the status quo. Uh, that is the proposed amended budget and the status quo low balance is in fiscal year 2024 
um, 83.5 uh, million. Again, so this is 76 million compared to 83.5 million um, in fiscal year 2024. So with the uh, with the purchase scenario, there's again I mentioned it's it's going to be funded by we assume it's going to be funded by uh, debt issuing uh, for the full cost. Uh, issuing debt will impact um, debt coverage ratios, as, as shown on the top chart there. Um, currently, our current uh, debt coverage ratio um, is at 700 uh, percent. Um, so with with the issuing of the six eight million dollar um, debt issuing the uh, that coverage ratio will fall to 300% in fiscal year or by fiscal year 2026. Um, and if we look further out, uh, it will not fall below uh, 280%. So we just um, want to note that. Um, with the partnership purchase, uh, 5 million contribution and a million in L&M, uh, the low balance is in fiscal year 2024, still above target as seen there. Um, the bars um, over the, the, the line, uh, $74 million uh, ending cash balance in fiscal year 2024. Uh, that's approximately 10 million above the reserve target uh, with this scenario. Okay, and now, so we're moving on to another set of scenarios. Um, this is looking at uh, uh, potential changes to our contribution uh, for pension and other post-employment benefits. So we're providing to, to you three scenarios. Um, scenario one is a more conservative, uh, using a more conservative uh, discount rate um, of, uh, of 6%. Again, all these three scenarios um, assumes it's a level dollar payment. It's, it's the same amount every year. And the, um, the district would be fully funded for both uh, a program by June 30, 2032. So in about 12 years. Again, the, the first scenario is a 6% discount rate. Um, second scenario is a 6.5% discount rate. Uh, this is the status quo discount rate that's used in our actuary um, valuation. Um, and on top of that is adding uh, an annual contribution uh, based on an estimated uh, April 30th, uh, 2020 market condition. Um, this is provided to us uh, both by the um, or um, actually the estimate. So with, with the second scenario, um, one is the additional annual payment of a million dollars to uh, for pension and $400,000 for OPEC. The third scenario um, is again, assuming 6.5% status quo discount rate uh, plus the one-time payment in, in the fiscal year 2021 um, for pension and OPEC. The one-time payment for pension uh, would be $8.4 million. Um, the OPEP uh, one-time payment would be $3.2 million. Okay, so again, here, here are the charts, the general fund ending balances. With the first scenario, with the more conservative uh, discount rate of 6%, um, the low balance is in fiscal year 2024 at $73 million. That's 8.3 million above our target. Okay, this is a, um, a scenario two with six and a half percent discount rate plus an annual payment. So a recurring annual payment over the next uh, 12 years. So the low balance for this scenario, again, is in fiscal year 2024. Uh, the low balance is uh, $78 million. Uh, that is about $13 million above uh, target. So the, with the one-time um, uh, scenario, this is sending uh, one-time payment uh, to both pen, uh, for both pension and OPEB. Um, the low balance uh, is in fiscal year 2024 again, um, but the low balance is $71 million. Uh, which is about six and a half million above the, the reserve target. All right, uh, thank you, Sydney. Let's count rate on, on pension and OPEB uh, assumes that we are doing everything else just like is in the status quo budget. 
So we would still do a 3% rate increase uh, next March 1st. Um, you know, no decline in development activity, uh, no participation in the ranch, right? So, uh, so we have not mixed and matched. Um, I can tell you in having mixed and matched with staff ahead of the workshop that there's a lot of red ink involved if um, all of these things happen. And so uh, while the district does have a lot of financial capacity, uh, we cannot uh, afford to do all of these things. And so, um, you know, uh, but what we did want to put in front of the board for consideration is, you know, if there are any of these scenarios that uh, that you feel that we should be uh, accounting for in our planning, uh, you know, as staff, we we feel that the development activity seems like it's going okay. Water demand seems like it's going okay. Um, you know, we don't have direction yet uh, related to N3 Ranch. Um, you know, and so when you when you look at those factors and, and you consider the savings we have on pension and OPEB, you know, if the status quo is maintained, uh, as was noted, um, we could forego uh, by the modeling as it stands now a rate increase. And so we just wanted to put these scenarios and, and these uh, concepts in front of the board and uh, and uh, open it up for discussion and questions. Questions or comments from the board? Uh, John Wieda, quickly. The one area where we have seen extraordinary fluctuations in the past has been in CalPERS and OPEB investments, and reflecting the market where we were overfunded, and then suddenly we found ourselves less than 50% funded. Um, that can happen. So in developing a policy and strategy, hopefully we work toward developing a more conservative investment approach, which are not as vulnerable to um, fluctuations in the market. And second, that we set some interim goals that we at least can get on a very conservative basis are those who have retired, leaving those who are still on the job at uh, great, some, well, giving great, greater assurance to those who have retired that there's money in the bank to take them to their retirement. Thank you. So, Director Wee, do you have any preferences or comments on the scenario that's presented by the staff? I prefer longer term rather than one term investment strategies. And uh, to that extent, um, yes, I like the lower discount rates um, that help. But one of the, the, in addition to the lower discount rate, you have an investment strategy and there are three different programs in OPEB. We have the most ambitious one currently. It was a result of this bizarre market it has been the poorest performing. So in the last several years. Okay. Um, so I will take that as you actually like the OPEP scenario best. Oh, I like an OPEP. There are three OPEP scenarios. Right. I like the one that has a continuing payments and that. Um, right. So number two, 6.5% 6, 6 discount rate with additional annual contribution for both pension and OPEP. Thank you. Okay. That's uh, the OPEP option two. All right. Director Sethi. I concur with uh, Director Weed on that strategy. I'll leave it at that for right now. Okay. Director Gunther. You need to take your, yeah. Yeah. Well, let, me, um, let me just say, let me, I'm sorry, Jim. Uh, I, I want to expressly say that I'm supporting that option, understanding that uh, I wish not to make the one-time payments to uh, the pension and OPEB accounts. Just continue what we're doing. Okay, so your preference is a continuance, not Director Wee's preference of making additional annual payment. The additional annual payment does, is, is fine with me. Okay, so you're also OPEB option two. All right, Director Gunther, sorry. Oops. Okay, I, I think that's where uh, there's, there's some I'm having a little confusion in that there was the foregoing of the 3% rate increase. And my view on this right now is that if we have the extra funding, we should um, put it towards the OPEB. Um, I, I, I think that's a very good plan for that. And it's consistent. We plan as to where we are. Um, 
what our plan funding is. If we have extra money, we put it towards it. And it also allows us if the, let's say scenarios change in the near future, we're planning along those lines, we can shift that money away from that additional money funding to what we might need it for uh, later. Uh, can you figure out what I just said? <laughs> Let me see. You also prefer OPAV additional annual payment due to the potential saving for the district. <laughs> I I think that's yeah. I think that's where I'm going with it. If we if we have additional money coming in, we continue along where we're planning, and we take that money at the moment and we put it there. And if we need it to move somewhere else, we can. Okay. Thank you, Director Akbari. Questions, comments, preferences. Uh, no questions at the moment. Uh, my sense is also to go with the OPEB scenario to to increase our um, annual payments uh, slightly, and uh, rather than do a one-time payment um, or or uh, go through some of the other scenarios for pretty much the same reasons that were mentioned by the other directors as well. So, all right. So I actually do have a question for staff because I will say my first inclination is to forego the rate increase, but the potential saving for prepaying pension and OPEP is a little bit too attractive. So the question for staff is, how much savings are we talking about for doing these additional annual payments? Yeah, so um, basically what doing these additional payments now does is it starts to amortize this year's market losses immediately. And so if we don't start doing this immediately, uh, what we'll see is when we have our next valuation two years from now, uh, assuming the market doesn't make it up next year, right? Uh, is we would see an increase in our contributions. Um, and so basically what we're doing is amortizing this year's losses over 12 <laughs> years, because that's what's left in our schedule, as opposed to waiting two years, seeing what happens, and then any performance differential being amortized over the 10 years that would then be left at that point in time. John, John, uh, let me uh, ask a question here. At the April finance meeting, I believe, uh, the committee was reviewing whether to wait another year for the uh, revaluation of, of things next summer in order to, I thought the conclusion was it would be better to wait till next summer than make any adjustment right now. Yeah, so uh, when the actuary presented to the board in, in April, we did discuss um, some of these concepts and, and whether we want to um, kind of make adjustments now or simply do the new valuations every other year and, um, uh, and then wait and see what we get at that point in time in two years and, and adjust then. And, you know, kind of the general uh, consensus feeling um, at that time, although we didn't have total district financial information presented at that point in time, like we have uh, with the budget presentation, you know, was to kind of um, do these valuations every two years and, and adjust then, um, you know, but uh, we do have these numbers from the actuary as far as if we wanted to start um, amortizing now. And uh, that seems to be where the consensus opinion is right now. Okay. So, so, Jonathan, I am really sorry to push you on this, but is it possible to come up with a dollar amount? I understand the concept of amortizing earlier, but for our customers, the question is very straightforward. If I live with, if you get this 3% out of me, what do I get in return? Mm -hmm. Right, and, and that's a number I'm trying to flush out. Is it even possible to quantify? Yeah, it's, um you would have to make a lot of assumptions about what next year's market performance would be and uh, what what would happen with the next actuarial valuation. Um, and so, you know, it's, yeah, that, I mean, there would just be a lot of assumptions involved in that. And, and it's possible that um, we have a great year in the market next year and, um, 
and it, it turns out that it wasn't necessary to make these extra payments. But it could also be that the market doesn't have such a good year and, uh, and we'll need to make even more significant payments in the future. Um, you know, but in terms of shortening an amortization period or um, starting an amortization now, so we're doing it over 12 years instead of 10, um, that's probably not going to be um, a huge difference when you look at over the whole 12 years. Uh, the one big thing it does for us though is um, is it reduces uh, a potential increase that we would see in a couple of years because we're continuing to maintain our contributions slightly higher, right? So we're not taking that full 3 million in savings and, and we're sort of betting that in a couple of years, um, we may lose some of that with the next actuarial valuation. So, so here's the struggle I have, Jonathan. So Judy the ratepayer who may or may not have a job due to COVID-19. And you're telling me I have to pay my 3% rate increase now for something that perhaps I will not see benefit, may or may not see benefit a couple years down the road. Is that what we're telling our customers? Yeah, well, I think um, the 3% is, is what's assumed. Um, we still have um, some flexibility above the red bar, um, as we can see on this scenario. So uh, how would the board like to see us uh, mix this scenario with foregoing a rate increase and see what happens? That, that was my next question. Is it possible to run that scenario? Zero rate I increase? I will ask Mr. Coran to fire that up on the model and uh, we'll see if we can show that within the next few minutes. It would be my pleasure. Thank you. This is playtime for me. And while you're setting it up, let me ask if our public members have any comments or questions for the board staff. And I see a hand. Thank you, President Wong. Oh, this is a very interesting set of presentations. And I think uh, Mr. Wundlich, uh sort of hit on a key point, which is, you know, this is all, all the scenarios run independently of each other, right? And, and what I think the board needs to consider is the probability that any one of these things or multiple of these items will occur, right? So if I recall from the presentation, the various scenarios included the impact of COVID-19, uh, one or two options related to the ranch, uh, options related to the pension funding, and then finally the, the option related to foregoing a rate, uh, a rate, rate increase for one year. You know, things, you know, certain things are totally under the board's control. For example, the ranch or the rate increase. Other things are, the other items are out of your control and you have to apply a probabilistic uh, guess as to their, 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 those assumptions coming true. Um, you know, COVID is here. We know, you know, your guess is as good as mine as to the, the actual end impact, but you know, it's, it's looking like it is going to be a substantial impact to the, the nation's economy. Uh, and then uh, on the pension, you know, I'm glad to hear that the other directors were uh, gravitating towards doing something about the pension. I mean, it is very clear uh, based on uh, some filings that cal uh, CalPERS has made. You know, one of the nice things about the fact that the, the state has to go to the, the investment community to borrow money is that they they basically have to open their kimono uh, and, and spill their guts about uh, what their, their, their own pension liabilities. Um, and, you know, by their own admission, uh, you know, they've already reduced their actuarial rate from 7.25 down to 7%, um, you know, by fiscal year, uh, this, this fiscal year, uh, 1920. Um, you know, the, both their five and 20 year uh, average rates fall below seven and a quarter percent. Uh, in fact, the 20 year rate is only 5.8%. And CalPERS has publicly indicated that it in expects actual investment returns in the next 10 year period will be less than 7%, right? So I think doing nothing about the pension is not the right answer because, you know, even CalPERS, uh, which is controlled by uh, a board that is very pro labor, uh, has admitted that they're not going to make 7%. 
Uh, and to Director or President Huang's question, they do actually in this uh, filing uh, go through several scenarios uh, what happens to your contributions if the actuarial discount rate changes. Um, you know, and they, they do put forth uh, scenarios that range from, you know, a paltry 1% actuarial, actuarial rate, which I don't believe is uh, likely to happen, but, you know, they do talk about the impact of a 4% uh, rate. Um, and, and, you know, it, because of the compound uh, interest nature of, of this, it is a fairly steep uh, sensitivity to, to the, uh, the discount rate. I'm sure uh, Mr. Wondelik uh, can can do the, the math as well, and um, you know so I, I I do strongly urge the board to consider uh, the, uh, doing something about the the pension because it is something that's likely to happen. Uh, some impact from COVID is likely to happen. Um, you know, I, I am sympathetic as a ratepayer to the, the need or to, to explore the possibility of foregoing some or all of the rate increase uh, that's planned um, due to the impact of COVID-19. Uh, I just do not see any merit whatsoever uh, in spending dollars on the ranch. Uh, so that's my input on, on, on these financial scenarios. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question and comments. So do we get to play with the scenarios, Mr. Strom? Yeah, so what you have in front of you now is, is what it looks like if we forgo the rate increase and make the supplemental annual payments for our pension and OPEP liabilities. And so you can see that uh, we do have the one year where we dip slightly below, uh, you know, but all in all, um, you know, assuming there are, are none of the other impacts, right, um, this is something that looks viable. Okay, if the rest of the director do not have any comments, I have yet another scenario I would like you to run, actually a couple more. All right, hearing none. So what happens if you add the COVID-19 impact to this chart? So no rate increase, make the annual OPAP payments, and add in one of the COVID scenario, or half of it if you want. Yeah, uh, Martin, why don't so you perhaps the full scenario? Let's do 20% on the commercial. 20% declines. Oh, I see Mr. Koran, you're the one that's running the models. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And then 50% development activity. Sorry, it takes a little while to calculate because it's a big file. Um, no, no problem. If you've been to previous financial workshop, you would know that I'm the one who always love to play with your models. Oh, oh it's my pleasure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, that doesn't look good. <laughs> yeah, and if you want to, I mean, it's probably... We can see what it looks like a few extra years out if yeah. you would com be comfortable seeing that. Okay, so that's definitely. But I would I would <laughs> caution about going too far out though because um, there's just once you get more than a few years out, there's just so much uncertainty with the financial mm -hmm. projections. I know, but it's 2020. Oh, is 2024 that far out? <laughs> Not really, is well, it? Yeah, and we go through here through 26, so. Right. Uh, and, and these are, are getting to balances. You know, the previous scenario, we were 1.3 million under in, in just yeah. one year, but um, you know, yeah. these balances are getting a little more significant. Yeah, no, this is, this is actually starting to hurt. Okay. Um, can you run a scenario with the expected rate increase, but the annual OPEP payment and COVID? So go back to 3% rate increase next year? Yes. So if we have the revenue losses, okay. but do not forego the 3% rate increase next year, then 
the balances are all above target. Okay. So we could actually afford to do this OPEX scenario even with, okay, even with the projected or, or, or model decline due to COVID-19, okay. Right, you know, based on what we're seeing so far, um, we're, we're not seeing those reductions. Right. So if we were to go with this kind of scenario, then I think when staff would come back and financial planning workshops to talk about uh, what, what type of rate increase we should look at, then the burden would really be on us to demonstrate, okay, what's happened? Uh, you know, what are we seeing that generates the need for this increase? Right, so, so here, here's my question for staff then. If we, today, we express preference for paying down OPAP and um, pension, when could staff bring back the scenario with 0% rate increase or rates with a more realistic expectation of more realistic projection of the impact of COVID-19 in terms of our income? Yeah, I think what we've tentatively scheduled uh, for rates, financial planning workshops is to have one in August and another one in October. Okay. And, um, you know, I don't know what we'll learn between now and then. Um, you know, another, if we're just kind of uh, going on the fly a little bit, something we haven't really modeled could be instead of fully foregoing a rate increase, could be slightly deferring a rate increase, uh, depending on what we see. You have, to, you have to define deferring because deferring to me means we will defer by six months. Or are we talking about yeah, so foregoing a part of it? Yeah, yeah, so I, I, sh I should have used a different word, delaying, slightly delaying a rate okay. increase. Yeah. So, um, you know, I just don't know yet what we will, you know, we just don't know what the next few months will bring. Okay. But certainly, um, when we would come to the board for a rates financial planning workshop, we would bring any COVID-19 updates and, and how that's affecting our finances. Okay. So with that understanding, I think I am actually willing to support going for the OPAP annual additional annual payment scenario with the understanding that we will be talking about rate increases and potential for no foregoing, foregoing or deferring, delaying rate increases, increase for the next fiscal year um, once we have more data or well, hopefully we'll get more data at our rate workshop. Right. And it, I think, you know, we're not going to see when it comes to water demand, you're not going to see reductions to water demand in the wintertime. So where you're going to see it is in the summer. If, if a lot of uh, residential customers may be experiencing personal financial hardship, uh, you know, they, they might decide not to water their lawns this summer. And so we might not see the same type of peak water use, you know, as an example. And so uh, if, if we were to come in late summertime, we should start to have a better idea of, of what some of those impacts might be. Okay, that, that would be appreciated. And just a note, when you come back to talk about rate impacts, I would also like to see um, the rate of our bill delinquency, payment delinquency, just to get a sense of how our community is doing at that time. Yeah, and, and actually we can bring an update on that to the June 11th board meeting as part of the budget adoption presentation. Um, you know, what we're at right now is about 550000 in past due balances as of the end of April. And that was only an increase of $27,000 uh, compared to what we were at at the end of March. And so to date, uh, based on the data we have, our customers are continuing to pay their bills on time. Uh, but what we can show the board July, uh, June 11th is uh, the status at the end of May, because that's a monthly report we run from our customer information system. I'm definitely looking forward to that, um, but I am also curious to see the effect once everybody spend down their stimulus payment. <laughs> so yeah, there are different variables, right? So for now, I, I have monopolized enough of your time. Um, do we have any other questions, comments from directors? Director Sethi? Yes. So I'd like to make two points and, and also ask for a scenario to be run here. 
um, as I pointed out in the last board meeting, uh, except for January, we've been running ahead of our demand forecast uh, in the community, which is surprising given COVID-19 and you know some impact to commercial uh, and small businesses. So Director Gunther and I were in the water resources meeting yesterday and we got a close look at uh, demand. In the wintertime, it was running about 28 to 32 MGD. And then it jumped up to about 34 and uh, for April. And uh, for May, we've been averaging around 42. And on Monday, it shot all the way up to 48, over 48 MGD. So we're running ahead on the May forecast too right now. Um, that's good news for the district. Number two, uh, if you look at the uh, long-term horizon in the financial dashboard, you see 3%, 3% uh, for every year looking out right now. Mm -hmm. um, that makes me feel really comfortable because the, the one thing I've driven for, and you've heard me say it repeatedly, before I was on the board and since I've been on the board, we need reliability and predictability, sustainability in our revenue uh, outlook. And, you know, I at least fought real hard for the 500% increase we went through over a period of years on the, on the fixed charge. Uh, John, we did too, Marty Kohler. Uh, and now the results are producing themselves where we really do have this, uh, uh, for the most part, a reliable uh, uh, revenue stream. I know John will disagree in some ways, but you know, 85% of our revenue is, is pretty much there with about 15% variability, you know, depending upon circumstances. So <clears throat> uh, I like this aspect of our long-term uh, rate increase outlook because that's what I've been driving for over the years. I am in favor of, uh, and I know this is not a rate workshop, so we'll have that discussion later on. But as I expressed last week, I'm not in favor of anything over 3% three, 3%, 3 3 in our outlook. And we might be able to do something even a little bit lower, 2.75, 2.75, or 2.5, 2.5. I don't know right now. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, I think it's very important for the, the district just to have consistency in its rate increases and rate outlook. It also helps future boards and future management teams at ACWD to um, have a, a really good safe understanding of what they're dealing with. And this uh, financial dashboard provides that. So the third scenario I would like to run through here, if I may, Martin is, uh, <clears throat> Take the assumptions we've made so far on, on uh, uh, OPEB and pensions. Uh, no impact from COVID-19. And then uh, the maximum price purchase on the N3 ranch of 68 million. And I'm not sure what uh, uh, market rate you're using, but the uh, report I sent out from a couple of Wall Street firms last week was indicating that we could put out a AAA rated bond right now for, for uh, about 1.85%. So as I figured it out, 1.85% translated into 2.7 million a year annually at 68 million. It was 2.5 at 65 and uh, 2.3 at 62. So let's just 
let's use 2.7 million with uh, 2 million a year in O and M. Okay, so right now I have the scenario set except for the exact percentage on the interest payment. I forgot what we're, let me check what we have it going at. For, for the real estate purchase, we're looking at 4% over 30 years. Yeah, we're far off on mm -hmm. that. That might have been true in the, during the market volatility in March and April, but markets have settled back down. I would use 2% just to be on the safe side. Yeah, so uh, we did use 4% um, when we initially created this scenario uh, based on advice from our uh, financial advisor on, on what would be conservative. So 4%, you know, I would agree with Director Sethi that based on the current conditions, we, we could expect to get less than 4%. Um, 2% we might get today, um, but there would be, I think, some risk that it would be higher than 2%, say, six months from now, uh, when something might actually uh, be going into the marketplace. <clears throat> you know, uh you're smarter at this than I am, Jonathan, but uh, we're well below uh, where the interest rates were in, in January 2012 and January 2015 when we went to market with our two, two previous bonds. So if you want to use 2.5%, be my guest here. I don't think it's going to be anything higher than that a year from now in the middle of a recession. Right. So, so the question here is that might be true for the first, second year, but right now the way the model is running, you're also projecting 2.5% for the out years too. That might not be realistic. No, that's, that's what you, 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 you would get the bond at that price. Oh, for 30, true. For 30 years. We're buying the bond. That's correct. So, um, so issuing, we, issuing a bond. Uh, from this scenario, uh, we do stay above the reserve target. So we can meet our OPEB and pension obligations and finance the ranch at the full purchase price. Not, I hope we don't do it at the full purchase price, but uh, can you see what that looks like at close to 2%? Yes. And then, uh, one so this is 2.5% right yeah. now, and you want to see it at 2 Yeah. And, and just one thing while Martin is uh, kind of inflating the size for us there is that as a reminder, this scenario also includes full financing on the capital cost for AMI because uh, otherwise we would run into some near term cash flow issues. Uh, so uh, to help manage the near term cash flow, there is extra debt for AMI. Okay, I'm trying to see where the break even point is here. Can we do? 2.75 or 3%, see what happens there. Okay, at 3%, we're still okay. Yeah, we were actually okay at 4%. Yeah. Oh, okay, so we can go all the way up to 4%, but I'll put down, I'll put down a serious bet today that we're not gonna see anything over 3%. So, so can I tweak this scenario, Director Sathy? If you <coughs> yeah. Take out the 3% rate increase. What does it look like? Well, I have to minimize the screen, otherwise I can't find it. Okay. Not as pretty. So basically we are, in, we are charging a 3% rate increase to buy a wrench. No, no, no. Without, without the wrench, we could forego the 3% increase. Everything will look fine. With the wrench, we have to raise our rate by 3%. So, so I think this is not the right place for this discussion. <laughs> I think we, the two of us, actually the five of us will have great discussions when we are talking about rates and financial impact to the rate structure. I think just to be fair, I have asked staff to keep open uh, the scenario of 0%. I am going to guess either Director Sethi or Director Wee will ask 
staff to keep open the option of purchasing the ranch outright. Is that correct? No. Okay, not, so. Not at all. Okay, no. so you'd rather we don't present follow up with the full purchase of the ranch option in our rate discussion? Well, since I was added on, no, John, uh, let me let me let me clarify myself here. Okay, <laughs> uh, I'm not for using our cash reserves to purchase the ranch. Not at all. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. I'm, I, I'm, I'm for financing the ranch, and before the ranch discussion even came up last fall, we were already in our financial dashboard looking out three percent, three percent. And so I have been consistent since last October or uh, August saying we don't need anything over 3%, 3% in order to finance the ranch. And what I'm saying, all I'm saying is that I believe is your wish to keep the scenario when we talk about rate. And I think that is a correct statement. Okay, Martin, I want you to run one last thing. Let's sure. take Judy's assumption here of, of, a, of, a, zero percent this, this coming year okay and put in plug back in two percent on the uh on the debt right instead of the four percent well that's not bad a million dollars okay so i think I think we will have to have this discussion when we seriously talk I, about this. I would call that just, you know, sitting near where we want to be. Doesn't matter whether we go a little bit below or we're a little bit above. The, the, the red line is, is, uh, isn't, is based on having six months reserve and a little bit of, uh, of some arbitrariness in our general fund too. We've got, uh, other reserve funds that we could use here as well. I am There's just going of, to, there are I'm a lot of ways to play a lot of ways to play with this. And, and we will we will be looking at this, but Director Wee has the floor. I think he's been very patient. <laughs> okay. Okay. A three percent three million dollars, which is what a three percent rate increase is on a three on a sixty-eight million dollar purchase, it's not a, an option of one versus the other. It's not a it's not that's not the trade-off. To give up a $3 million rate increase or, or grant a three, in order to purchase a 60, make a $68 million purchase. That doesn't make sense. That's point one. Point two, and you could still have a revenue neutral and bring on, do, so do some work on bringing our uh, rate structure into balance with our uh, expenses and, and cost. So thank you. I, I think it's very clear that we have very different opinions and we will have a really good discussion when we start looking at the financial model in terms of rate increases. So I think at this point, the staff have enough information from us. I think you heard the preference that we would like you to keep the scenario with annual payment, additional annual payment to OPEP and pension and keep open the 0% rate increase scenario and purchasing the ranch outright scenario. Yeah, so um, uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and assume that we are done uh, playing with the model at this point, and I'll ask Mr. Coran to stop uh, sharing his screen, and then I will share mine again. Okay. Let me just verify with the rest of the directors. Are, are we officially done with running the scenarios? For today, uh, I think I've seen what I need. Okay, thank you, Director Akbari. All right, Mr. Wonderlich, I think we are happy with the scenario we have run so far, so let's move on. All right, so that really brings us to the conclusion of today's budget workshop. Um, the only specific change I heard that, that we wanna make in the budget itself is to begin the additional annual pension and OPEB payments. And so the budget we bring to the board for adoption at the June 11th board meeting will include those extra funds to begin those supplemental payments. Uh, all other, uh, there are a few other minor updates uh, that were noted throughout, for example, uh, the timing of a re-roofing project at headquarters and a couple of other minor 
changes. Uh, but in terms of kind of big picture, it will be the pension and OPEB will be the only change. And that will be incorporated uh, to the budget we bring uh, back in a couple of weeks. And so uh, with that. Uh, Mr. Wunderlich, if I just may just yep. interject for just a moment. Um, I want to remind the board that we picked this up pretty much at the capital improvement program review and we covered the expense budget last week. So I just wanted to give the board one last opportunity. If there was anything in the expense budget, you know, and the staffing recommendations and so forth uh, that you want us to reconsider uh, because the next time you see a budget, it's going to be basically the budget. And that will be on June 11th. Well, Bob, uh, I already discussed this with you last week. I was planning on bringing up in our closed door session this evening, the staffing issue concerns that I had. And so I don't want to discuss those right here. I'd prefer to leave it for the closed door session. Okay. What, what do you think? Well, uh, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I know that uh, you are floating a proposal um, to uh, enhance the conservation programs of the organization. Um, that was one, one issue. Um, regarding sort of the performance goals of the general manager, if it's related to that, but doesn't significantly impact um, the budget, um, then that's uh, certainly fine uh, in, in the closed session. Well, uh, you got plenty of my uh, uh, water conservation input this past week. <laughs> Okay. So I, I will trust that staff listen to me and uh, will wisely try to uh, adopt a budget that might fulfill or at least give the opportunity of fulfilling some of those uh, opportunities that I was pointing out. So I don't want to go into detail about that right here. Okay. I was talking more about <clears throat> uh, engineering resources. Mm -hmm. Should yeah, we have a discussion uh, we, out in the open right now or leave it for closed door? Well, um, we can discuss that in closed session, I think. Okay. That's what I int had intended to do. So hopefully- okay. I just wanted to make sure that the entire board um, ha had an opportunity to, if they had any ideas or thoughts about the expense budget, um, to have an opportunity to convey them. Otherwise, if we're not ready to adopt the budget on, I think it's June, yeah, June 11th, um, that would necessitate maybe a special board meeting um, later in June, which I know uh, staff would not be in favor of. So I was hoping that the result, or one of the results of our closed door session would be a discussion about staffing, specifically engineering, resources, and that you would provide guidance back to your own senior management team after. Yeah, and, and um, depending on, because I'm not sure what the board is going to uh, ask uh, the general manager to do as part of the, the goals for next year and my performance evaluation. Um, if we need to amend the, the budget at some future point for a staffing related issue or something, that's always an option. So we could definitely talk about that in a closed session as long as we tie it back to the nexus of the general manager's evaluation. All right, so, so just keep that in mind. The closed session is general manager's performance evaluation and there has to be a nexus. There is. Okay, good. I've already, I've already discussed this with Bob last week. All right, that's all I want to point out. With that, do I have thank any you. other comments, questions from the director? Director Wee? Please, thank you. I would ask that whenever we discuss a program, whether it be conservation or AMI, in which conservation is part of the element, that we cost out the loss of revenue. 
and put that in as part of the proposal of the package for our consideration. It was not done when we developed a conservation plan. It was not done at AMI. And the numbers are in extraordinary. I think it was a major failure. Thank you. Director Gunther, any comments, questions? Oh, no, I'm unmuted. Um, no, I'm, I'm satisfied to move along. I, I don't agree with all the statements that have been made uh, regarding conservation and rate structure. However, that's for another meeting. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Director Akbari. Uh, I don't have anything to add at this point. Okay. So, with that, I I think, General Manager, you just need the feedback from the directors, and I think you have them. So with that... I will just check with Mr. Wunderlich to make sure that he also feels he has the appropriate feedback. Yes, I, I feel that I've received the feedback I need to bring a final budget to the board for consideration June 11th, and then uh, ideally we can all uh, engage in other activities in the evening of June 25th. Thank you very much. I, I, I um, guess. Can I can I make a request? I just this just came to my brain, um, which is suffering at the moment. Um, the concept, perhaps, of instead of a, a perhaps maybe we look at a rate increase, um, a differential one. Um, we raise perhaps the. Um, and, and I, I'm not, I don't have my ha hands around it completely, but we raise the service charge and maybe not raise the commodity charge as much. Um, <clears throat> I know a couple of years ago, we reached uh, a point where we were pretty much able to determine how much water we're gonna, we're gonna sell um, during the drought. We know what we're gonna have as a base. Um, and I remember that we were able to extrapolate from that where our service charge should probably be. And if I remember correctly, we're reasonably close to that amount. So I don't know if John could gin up that or recycle some of those numbers for the next meeting, but I would be curious um, uh, where, we, where we're going with that, or where we stand with that. Yeah. that that's well, Jim, you would have two strong supporters on the board in terms of- uh, Well, not this. Not necessarily um, because uh, I uh, I don't support a seventy percent or an eighty percent increase oh, well, in the service charge. Neither However, do I. I would like to get out there a the factor that we don't need that that okay. we have an idea of where we need to be. We may not be there yet, and that's what I'm looking at. I'm I'm totally with you, Jim. Go okay. for it. All right, so I'm, I'm interpreting that as a request for when we engage in uh, rate setting discussions and that we look at uh, different approaches between the service and commodity charges and we will uh, be ready to do that uh, at that point in time. Yes, thank you. thank you. I was going to say that is a request for additional scenarios and we are not having any discussion about it. Um, I don't on me that I've been remiss that I have not allowed our members of the public to speak after we run the scenario. So at this point, do I have any members of the public that wish to address the board? And Mr. Nishimura? Uh, thank you, President Wong. Um, a couple of points uh, to Director Sethi. Uh, right now on the open market, a 30-year AAA municipal bond is showing a bid, uh, I'm sorry, an ask with a yield to worst of 2.54, no bid. So I would expect that if you were to actually transact, it, the yield uh, would be slightly higher than 2.54%. Um, so, you know. Uh, 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 Mr. Nishimura, what you're probably looking at right now is the taxable AAA. No, I am looking at a non-taxable municipal bond. It is well, not a California issue. That is true. It is not a California issue, and uh, there because there are no secondary California municipal bonds on the open market right now, at the 30-year. Um, I, I after the meeting is over, 
I would be happy to send you uh, the same documents that I shared with everybody last week, which are Wall Street documents. I look this stuff up on a regular weekly basis. I think I know what I'm talking about between the taxable and the tax exempt AAA bonds. I, okay, we, 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 can, we can go back and forth on this, but the other point is we are that- not gonna, We are not going to be paying a higher interest rate today than we were in January 2012 or January 2015 because the, the interest rates are far below where they were then, period. The short-term interest rates, yes, the Fed, the Fed rates. The point is, whether it's 2.5% or 3% or even 2%, right? I mean, if you just use the number 3%, the debt service on $68 million at 3% is $2.867 million a year. Okay, if you say it's two and a half percent, it goes down to 2.687. The point I'd like to make is money is money, right? So that is still between two and a half and $3 million a year, uh, per year that the district would have to spend out of its operating budget to cover that debt service, right? So, you know, to you, this is basically in, in, in to your comment that you're not using the district's cash to buy the, the, the ranch but you're incurring for 30 years a debt service of somewhere on the order of two and a half to three million dollars a year. And that is approximately the magnitude of savings that the district has earned through its, through its OPEB, OPEB program, or it is roughly equal in magnitude to the revenues uh, that would be generated by this 3% rate increase, which is a, uh, the topic of, of conversation. <laughs> Yeah. So, but, so it's not free, is my point. Uh, uh, I, I never said it was free. Okay. I never said it was free, but as Mr. Wonderlich has pointed out, uh, we have tremendous borrowing capacity here. Of of all the districts in the in in the state, water districts in the state of California, we are right near the top in terms of. I, I understand that. Congratulations to, uh, to the board. Right. Just so, because you have, so just because you have a credit card yeah. with a hundred thousand dollar credit limit burning a hole in your wallet, does not mean that you should go and blow the hundred, borrow all hundred thousand dollars on that on something that makes no sense. Okay, well, I that, have right? a okay. and cut this off. Right. This, that's well, well, I don't. Right. I, I, I did, I'd like to make I, one last point I, I, no, without on. getting I, I, involved in on. in a welcome, back and forth. I welcome your comments but it really boils down to whether the board places value on that, that purchase or not. And Director Sethi, and, I agree with you. And that's a right. conversation we have to have, but let's let our members of the public finish his comment and then we're going to move on because this is not a appropriate place to talk about the purchase of N3 Ranch. Thank you, President Huang. The last point I was going to make was uh, to Director Weed's uh, comment about uh, accounting for the lost revenue uh, anytime the conservation programs are discussed. It's an interesting point. I, I would just say if that is uh, going to become the district practice, uh, in addition to uh, analyzing the lost revenue, the district should look at the reduction in the, uh, the cost to procure that water. And of course, to be actually accurate, it should be taking into account the uh, purchasing the, or, 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 or producing the most expensive water, right? So if conservation were to save one acre foot or reduce sales of water by one acre foot, uh, we should be purchasing one acre foot less of our most expensive water, which is likely to be SFPUC water in the next three to four years. That is my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. I think we have discussed this issue and there are more appropriate forum to talk about a ranch, to talk about a rate increase. And I look forward to all that discussion. But for now, I think staff has received the direction they need from the board. And okay. if I get a confirmation. If I, if I have an opportunity to quickly respond to a comment. With a 350% markup in our commodity cost, the marginal increase in a little more expensive water from San Francisco is easily dwarfed. It's not a major financial factor. And the offset, the cost 
So the revenue loss is far greater. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. So can I have a confirmation <clears throat> from the general manager? that staff has enough information from the board. I will check with staff for confirmation, Mr. Wonderland. Uh, yes, we have what we need from the board to bring a final budget that's you do not And Thank Mr. You. Stevenson. You might be on mute. He is. <laughs> <laughs> well, he had his chance. Okay. okay. Thank you. I got the up from him. <laughs> All right, so is that confirmation, Mr. Shaver? Yes, I will respond on okay. his behalf. I just wanted to give him an opportunity, but there really wasn't any um, uh, suggestions of substance on the CIP. Okay. My apologies, I had too many windows open and I had to dig down through my windows to find my uh, mute button. So, but thank you for the opportunity. All right, thank you. Then with that, let's move on to the next agenda item, which is general manager's report, please. Yeah, um, I, I guess I'll read the item. Um, let me make sure I'm not on mute. So item seven, uh, well, we actually have um, director's comments and our agenda item request first. Uh, I thought we're a general manager's report, number five. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I lost my uh, place here. Uh, yes, uh, no, no reports. Okay, and I thought we took director's comment and our agenda item request earlier. No. Actually, excuse me, I do have one thing from GM report. All right. Sorry, it's just all this finance stuff. Okay. Um, so uh, regarding the, the customer portal for AMI project, uh, I just wanted to, and this is related to the prior budget discussion, but SEW has agreed to a, provide a demo of their app. And I know there was some interest on the app by uh, at least a couple of board members, certainly Director Akbari. And uh, what, what I would like to do is offer a couple of possibilities. Um, you know, certainly I think it would be good to have not just Director Akbari um, basically get uh, some, some time uh, to better understand what the app is and what it's capable of. So uh, President Wong, uh, you could, uh, create an ad hoc committee to do that, um, have a couple of directors um, be able to do a deep dive into that. I think that would be appropriate. Um, or uh, we don't even have to make a committee if it's just a couple of directors. Um, if uh, the entire board or something is interested, then we would um, need to schedule a special board meeting or, or if three directors are, are uh, interested. And let me take this opportunity to see, do we have interest from the directors to learn more about this app? Just to, to reiter, reiterate, I, I, I'm certainly interested. Okay, Director Akbari. Uh, put me down for the list. Director Wee. I would, uh, in the interest of we keep it smaller, I, I would probably put myself in the category of Director Weed when it comes to the use of apps, uh, far less than the category of Director Akbari, who I'm very pleased to hear is to, desires to be involved in this because I'd probably be lucky if I could turn it on. So if I could turn it on though, that would be an extremely, um, uh, that would be a very positive statement for me. But uh, it may be difficult for me to do that. So I, I would, if Director Wee would like to be, uh, that's, I'm very okay with that. Director Sethi, are you interested? I'm interested in, in, uh, and even more broadly, I would like to see uh, SEW side by side with, on a demo with uh, WaterSmart. All right, so at this point we have three. So we're talking about a special board meeting or workshop. Yeah, the plan would not be to have a demo side by side. At the June 11th meeting, staff's plan is to keep the same recommendation and further respond to boards, um, the board members' concerns, um, but basically to recommend the same outcome that we did on uh, May 21st. So, um, 
what I'm hearing though, if, if you're interested in, in, in seeing the SCW app, and by the way, uh, WaterSmart does not have an app. So we can't do a side-by-side, -side, at least of that. We could do a side-by-side -side in another way. But if we get to that point, then staff's recommendation um, is to um, redo the whole entire procurement process. Okay, so so we can't do side by side because Water Smart doesn't have an app. So with that, Director Sethi, are you still interested in seeing SEW's app and yes. learning more about? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so <clears throat> Taylor, we need to set up a special workshop. I will ask the district secretary to set that up. Okay, thank you very much. So, Director Gunther, I guess you get to play with the app. See, you could turn it on. <laughs> Well, I will be a very good guinea pig to see how well this thing works. All right. So with that, any other general manager's report? No, thank you. And for director's comment, did I hear a hold on? I have more comments from the directors. I have one. Um, go ahead. All right. Go ahead. Want, does somebody else want to go first? Directors, we, would you like to go before Director Sethi? I'll make it just, mine is very brief. There is an um, upcoming uh, webinar hosted by Aqua on water, um, non-revenue water, which is really one of the emergency, emerging regulatory issues, and which I believe, and it's unfortunately, we weren't able to watch it before discussing the positive displacement versus ultrasonic meters. The accuracy of meters will be a major player in this world. Thank you. Thank you, Director Wee. Director Sethi? Yes. Um I kind of wanted to poll our board members, and I'm kind of feeding off um, uh, Ken's comments here. <clears throat> I'm wondering whether we should have a, and there's support for having a special board meeting solely de dedicated to N3 sometime over the next two weeks where we give a status report out to our community. It's been seven months since we've publicly really stated anything. We've got some really good financial analysis here that gives us a, a show of options, whether people agree with them or not, but at least we've got the information here. And I think it would be good to give a status report to the community and say, hey, listen, we heard all your input last fall. Uh, we were going down the path of option A, which we heard support for, which was uh, try to work with a coalition or a partnership. Hasn't panned out. We're considering a plan B. We'd like public input. Uh, and, uh, and then go into a closed door session to discuss where we're at. But we're, we've kind of reached the end of a long and winding road here. Uh, paraphrasing the Beatles, of course. And uh, I wonder if there's support on the board to do something like this. Comments from other directors? If not, I definitely have a thought. Um, and staff would probably have some, some suggestions if you get to that point. Right. Director Wee? Supportive. Can you repeat that again, Director Wee? Sorry. Oh, I support the concept. Okay. Um, any other directors wish to comment? Um, Gunther? Yeah, I guess I'd probably support the idea. I mean, we haven't, we've been in closed session about this. We all kind of know where all of our thoughts are, but I do think the public is probably wondering, okay, um, what's going on? Um, it's been a while, so it may not be, it's a big purchase. Um, it's probably worth bringing back out at least for another one meeting. Director Akbari? I'm certainly comfortable giving kind of a status update on, uh, on the N3 wrench. I'm curious if we can uh, include that as, a, as an item in the June board meeting or if staff feels it would be more appropriate to host a special board meeting on the topic. Yeah, I would. Um, if that's a question to staff, I would propose yes. that we have a closed session item at the June board meeting and then decide um, how you would like to do an open-ended, an open session item uh, after that. 
Okay, so staff is envisioning we have a closed session in June and then we could discuss what we should do with this. Correct, because okay. it does potentially impact your negotiations and your negotiators. Right, and I could definitely support that. I also think it's a good idea to give our committee an update on progress so far. I don't personally agree that we reach a dead end on the option, but it's always good to be transparent to our community. And I think direct uh, President Wong may have froze, or maybe I have froze. Uh, on my screen, it shows us frozen as well. Yeah, she, she's froze. Well, um, that makes you in charge, Vice President Akbari. <laughs> we probably should pause a few moments. And I, I, I would suggest that we, uh, we pause and let President Wong rejoin because it seemed like she had some comments on, on the current topic. So I, I want to give her that option to speak. Let me try texting her. Technology. Okay, I just sent her a text and the response is that um, her computer just crashed. Okay. Um, I could ask if she would like to convey any final words. <laughs> Yeah, I think let's let's ask President Huang if um, if she has any more comments on this item. Uh, otherwise, I'd be happy for us to move into the closed session and then bring the director's comment uh, agenda item after the closed session as well to give Director uh, President Huang another opportunity to speak. Sure. In in the meantime, you can also check if your colleagues have any other comments. Yeah. Uh, do any of the other directors have uh, any other comments or agenda item requests? Might it be a good idea uh, for us to have a, a little break between, uh, before we go into closed session in case uh, President Wong can reestablish connection here? Um, let me uh, just um, ask her if she wants to call and then I can put her on speaker. That would be good. Okay. Um, the only reason why I suggested that we might want to move to closed session is... No, uh, sorry, my apologies. It looks like my computer crashed and my Wi-Fi went down. How lovely. <laughs> well, we can hear you now. Yeah, I call in by phone. So I think we could move on to the closed session. Um, since my computer is completely dead, old general manager, can you read uh, item 7-1 for me? Sure. Um, so uh, item 7.1 is pursuant to California code section five. Uh, Bob, hold on, Bob, hold on. Yes. Did we want to close on the director's comments about what we wanted to do in closed session on June 11th 
Well, I know uh, Director Wong was suggesting that uh, we go to closed session on, um, but, uh, on, Z, on June uh, 11th. Director Akbari, was, Director Akbari was suggesting that we close out those comments that Director Wong was trying to express when she got cut off. Right. And we can put that item to bed. Sure. Um, so, Director, uh, President Wong, um, when you got cut off, you were saying that you would be okay uh, with having a closed session on June 11th and going from right. there. I think that's where you got. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Um, all I'm saying is it would be good to have a status update. It's good for transparency for us to report to our public. But at that workshop, not only we should talk about the current status of negotiation slash progress, we should also, if we're ready, we should also talk about potential financial impact using the default values. Yeah, and um, so what I suggest is uh, we give uh, you a status report, the board in closed session on the negotiations on June 11th, and then uh, the board can decide exactly how what they want to do after receiving that report. Okay, that definitely works. So I think with that, that ends my comments, and that should close out the director's comments, correct? Or did something happen when I am offline? I believe that closes out a director's comments. Okay, thank you, Director Akbari, and thank you for taking over the meeting while I am uh, <laughs> in the blue screen of death. Um, anyway, okay, so let's move on to item 7.1, which is the closed session. And before the general manager read the item, um, I just would like to remind the directors that we have to use a separate Zoom link and Ms. Marcou, send us two emails. Please use the link on the latest email, please. Okay, so item 7.1 is pursuant to California Government Code Section 54957, Public Employee Performance Evaluation, titled General Manager. So the board will now convene in closed session um, and we will come back to this open session uh, after the item 7.1 is completed. And just for the board, um, I am not planning on participating in the closed session. I typically don't participate in the closed session for the general performance evaluation uh, unless requested by the board. So unless there's a request, I'm not going to plan on participate. I will hang in the waiting room, so I'll be available for the open session item 8.1. Thank you. Um, with that, that's adjourned to the closed session. And as a reminder, please use the link Gina sent out. Yeah, and I would imagine that you may be participating by cell phone. I am going to try. My ACWD laptop is, my Wi-Fi is up. My ACWD laptop is up. I might um, give it a try. So, uh, so remind me here. All right, it's 9.05, the board just returned from closed session. Do we have a report back, General Manager? Uh, I think council can provide this report. I guess that would Met be- Met with the uh, General Manager and gave a performance evaluation. Is there anything else we should add? Um, I wasn't in that, so you should just read the agenda and report out. Okay. Why don't I do that? Hold on. Oh, let me bring up my agenda or, okay. Um, okay. So the board returned from, oh, great. My computer just shut down. <laughs> okay, well, I can do it for you. Thank you. Okay, so um, the board met, it is now 9.06. The board met in closed session and pursuant to California government code section 54957. Uh, they did a performance evaluation of the general manager. And that's the closed session report. Okay, so thank you. Then let's move on to item 8.1. I'd like to move the appointment of labor negotiators <laughs> be the uh, president and vice president of the board, Judy uh, Wong and uh, Aziz Akbari. Second. 
Do I have a second? Second. <clears throat> Roll call, please. Director Zakbari. Aye. Gunther. Aye. Sefi. Aye. Lee. Aye. And Huang. Aye. So the next is actually item 9.1 is another closed session. And Ms. Marthu, I could read it if you blow up the uh, <laughs> the font or the general manager could actually read the session for me. Okay, here we go. Item 9.1, it's pursuant to California Government Code Section 54957.6, Conference with Labor Negotiators. The agency designated representatives are Judy Huang and Aziz Akbari on representing employees, general manager. And with that, Ms. Marku, would there be a new Zoom link sent to us? Um, I believe you can just use the same one that you used earlier. Okay. I hope. Um, well, let me see so I can make sure that they use the right one. Well, I need to see if it's still. So it would be the second one that you sent that takes us to item Closed session, the one at 4.56 p.m.? Yes, if that doesn't work, let me know and I'll schedule a new one. So uh, you all see it? Um, yes. You received an email from Gina at about 4.56 p.m.? Yes. Okay, uh, we'll be waiting for you here. I'll be waiting for you and Gina will be um, back here when you're done. Okay. And then if you don't think you're gonna need legal counsel, um, so Zoom meetings have their advantages. All right, now we're being recorded. It is, the time is 9.26. The board has returned from closed session item 9.1, pursuant to California Government Code Section 54957.6, Conference with Labor Negotiators, Agency Designated Representative Judy Huang and Aziz Akbari on representing employee general manager, and the board provided direction to the designated representatives. So with <clears throat> that, I think that concludes today's special board meeting. Going once, going twice, hearing nothing from the directors, I will say the meeting is adjourned at 9.27. Hey,